everybody good morning thanks for being here this is a youtube only because my program has been glitching and i really don't want it to if i have if you if you didn't see on the twitter machine um bob mata will be joining me during closings lisa statman will be joining me during closings karen smith will be during joining me during closings. so we're gonna have three people four of us watching the closings together karen and Lisa have been in chat every day, so kind, lending their expertise. So we're gonna have Bob, Karen, and Lisa watching the closings. So excited for that. We have, I think, one more witness. I don't know how many more witnesses, but if you missed it, there are closings today, folks. Closings today. Additionally, while we're in Verdict Watch, I won't be streaming, but I have a premiere set up. Uh, Babe is just working on the thumbnail. It's all uploaded. So just keep your notifications on. I will be doing a premiere during while we're in, in, in Verdict Watch. And to me, there is no way. There was already a juror asking about the next week. They're going to be done this week. If not today, definitely tomorrow, I think. Um, it's not Wendy. It's regarding this case. Uh, good morning, defense attorney Meow, Mandy, Annie, Amy, Melissa, MJ, Wildfire, Dizzy, Anita, Southern Charmed, Sarah, Creative Minds. Let me just make sure we don't miss anything. Squadushal over here. All right, we're all set up. Uh, Kay is here. Uh, Pam Coggin, KTG, Mish, Amber, KJ, Lamam, James, Deja Vu, Jersey Jen, Stevie Irwin, Mimi to Seven, Cindy Arno. Please take your meds. Margaret Williams. Uh, Amanda's here. I'm missing people. I know it. Tennis girl. Um, next chapter. Legal mama Jan. Sue City Sue. Tashi. Thanks for being here, everybody. Amy Albers. Amy in Jersey. Law nerd Amber. Lakota. Lisa the sober hipster. Um, Marina, Pamela Holtzman, good morning guys, thanks for being here, or good afternoon where you are, or good evening, I don't know, Joanne is here, Stacy Hanlon, Fuzzy Puff, Shaky Lou, Afy, Lisa Dempsey, Mike, Mike Led Games is here, good morning guys, there's Karen, she's in the chat, she's going to be joining me during the closings, can't wait. Uh, Mi Mystic Mama is here. Cabo is here. Mia is here. Karen is here. You're welcome, Creative Vine Minds. Screaming Daisies. Annie G. Um, my mom and dad are here. Hey, Mona. Ashney. Thanks for being here, everybody. Elizabeth L. is here. Kimmy's Blessed is here. Just waiting, as always, waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, I'll tell you what the video is about. Something occurred to me yesterday and this morning when I woke up and I'm like, I gotta make a video about this. We know that last Del Boca, that last Del Boca Vista uh, expert was terrible, right? Can't argue that. Just did a terrible job. Shouldn't have been up there. But something occurred to me. It wasn't always that he was. It wasn't just that he was terrible. It was how he was presented by defense counsel. Like, they did not do a good job prepping him. They did not do a good job asking questions. So my video that will be premiering once we're in Verdict Watch is a comparison of the state's expert, Lucian Haig, and, and Del Boca Vista, who trained with George Washington. And it's a little comparison of the two. I hope you guys like it. I had to spend $10 for a... 
I was looking for surf circus music, but there's no free circus. I mean, there might be free circus music, but not what I wanted to use. So um, I uh, I have some circus music that I pay ten dollars for a license. So hopefully the video makes ten dollars. Um, but I think you guys will like it. And by the way, let's see if my thing is. Let's th see if the uh, counter is working. Cause if you can believe this. Please work, please work, please work. Where is it? Squadushal. There it is. We are we have got we are fourteen thousand one hundred. Nine hundred to go to fifteen K, folks. Hey Suzanne. Suzanne says hi Jay. Been lurking in the background. Love your channel. Thank you, Suzanne. Don't forget to change from top chat to live chat because I just forgot to do that. Got to squadushal this out of here. Squadushal. Um, hi, Cecilia. Hi, Joni. Steve. Betty. Thanks for being here, everybody. Helen Steiner is here. Good morning. We love our lurkers, too. That's correct. How do I send coffee? It's in the... Um, Karen says, how do I send coffee? It's in the description also. Let me see. Is, is coffee... I forget... It's in my link tree. Let me share that. Hopefully the bot is working. Mom, Crime Junkie, what's up? KJ, what's up? There it is. The coffee should be in there. Pin this message. All my links are in there, folks. Good morning, Muffy. Good morning, Bonnie. Kimmy's blessed. Oh, I have a new sound effect. Let's see if the bot is awake. My mom is here watching too. We both have covered, so we're recovering with UJ and all boss nation. Oh, Kimmy's blessed. I hope you and your mom. Thanks for watching. Thank you for the super chat. I hope you guys. I hope you guys feel better soon. Um. Someone just gifted a membership. Because I'm gonna bunk with you, Sweet buddy. Sweet Lou. We're gonna be buddies. We're gonna be pals. We're gonna. Rock the rock. Gifting a membership to Sheila Duffy. Thank you so much. Sweet Lou gifting a membership. Welcome, Sheila. Good morning, Squatchaholic. Oh, wow. $10 from Linda. Let the games begin. Right facing fist, left facing fist. Thank you so much, Linda. I really appreciate that. Oh, Anita, you are too kind, Anita. Thank you for the $10. Circus Music Fund. Thank you so much. So if you could tell, I got some uh, criticism. Actually, it was they weren't very nice about it, but they were they were probably correct. Uh, they said, I can't stand the music when you get money, the song. I'm going to Emily Baker's channel. But granted, the song was a little much when, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest. With you, I, I didn't used to get a lot of super chats. So the song playing the song playing once was not a big deal, but a bunch in a row. I can see that. So now I have. The sound from Mario, the coin sound. So, thank you so much, Anita. Thank you for the circus. Because I'm going to bunk with you, buddy. We're going to be buddies. We're going to be pals. We're going to wrestle around. Not only did Linda give a super chat, she gifted a membership. Who got it? Suzanne Seidel. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Linda. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, Miko. We are, we are waiting. We are waiting. I get it, Pam. I, I will take Chris. I will. Oh, here we go. If something I think is valid, I will I will change it. That I think was a valid criticism. It was Beetlejuice, but it was a little bit long of a song. So now we just got the the uh, coin. Um, Hello, Steve will miss it. Some people will miss it. I get it. I could do. I. I, I was. I didn't do a lot of research. I was just. I was. I was on uh, Botrix trying to figure out a good sound effect, but nonetheless. Um, I thought I saw some movement there. That's what she said. I hope you guys like the I as as suspected. Oh wow, wildfire. This is for the giggle fest yesterday. 
Thank you so much, Wildfire. Um, thank you. I couldn't hold it in. I could not keep it together yesterday, folks. I could not keep it together. Thank you so much, Wildfire. What was I saying? I forget now. Thank you all so much for the super chats. Oh, and I also got a coffee from someone, I think. Karen, Karen Ladd in the chat just bought me a coffee. Karen, thank you so much. Here's some Beetlejuice. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you so much, Karen. Kimmy's Bless says, please pay GPP. You got it. Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal. By the way, there are more and more people who have taken that clip and alleging it's from Fanny Willis, which it is not. I, Joe Jackalone tagged me on Instagram, this huge account, this comedian. They don't know. People don't know. So it's, it's wild that one video that someone took and everyone just took it for gospel. It's just wild. That's the internet for you. That's why you always, always think before you see something on the interwebs. Interwebs, you never know. All right, here, here's the question, folks. I guess it, I guess it's hard to say right now, but do you think we will get a verdict today? I guess it depends who, how many witnesses they call, when the closings are. If not, uh, today got to be tomorrow, I think. And I gotta thank you guys all. Thank you so much for watching this trial folks this has been a wild trial one of the wildest trials i have ever covered um and i appreciate everyone who has all the people who have been here all the new people thank you so much it means the world that we say it all the time and not lying i know you have other options so thank you for watching it with us And Babe just sent me the thumbnail. Awesome. Um, thank you, Babe. Let me add it to the video that I'm about to upload. I'm going to premiere later. Let's go in there. Oh, it looks really good. Thanks, babe. Great job. Who wants to see the thumbnail? Uh, Alec Baldwin. All right, let me let me upload this. Here is what the thumbnail looks like for the premiere that I'm going to do today. I just I'll set it up. I just don't know when they're going to it'll be. What's up MH? Here's the thumbnail. Let me add it to the here. It's going to be full screen, so I'm going to go disappear for a second. Hold on. There it is, folks. Which expert are you choosing? If you are, if you're this jury, oh, hold on, shit. Which, which, which expert are you gonna choose? Watch is Charlotte. What's up, Raul? Thanks for being here, everybody. So I hope you guys like that premiere, which we will be doing, which I will be doing when we're in verdict watch. And also, my program is making a little noise, and it's driving me fucking bananas, and I don't know what the fuck it is. Oh, this is, this is bad.
How about that guy saying I did not point my uh, gun at the judge? How about that? Imagine saying that after you literally would just everyone just saw you do it. Thanks, mods is right. The ma the mods couldn't do this without the mods. Thanks, the mods is correct. What's up, Jonathan? Uh, Borden, Ladybird, Monica Steebs, Judy Jettison. Thanks for being here. Babe, everyone loves your thumbnail. Pamela Court is here. Mike is here. Good morning, Cam. Dabney. Fuzzy puff. All right, see movement. Camera person is falling asleep. I don't know why it's moving like that, but here we go. Hey, you is in Sacramento. Kerry Louise is here. Four dollar super chat from Ladybird. Thank you so much, Ladybird. Thank you, Ladybird. You're awesome. Thank you. Hit that like button, folks. No, I don't. I'm, I don't think. Maybe in the beginning it did. I don't remember if it's ever started on time. What's up, Daz is here. Yes, change from top. Don't forget to change from top to live chat. Honestly, I don't think it mattered that much a while ago when we were in the chat because it was the same chat. But now that we have more folks in here, I think if you don't have it on live chat, you might miss some chats. Legal Mama Jan, gifting out a membership Bing to bong. Cam Miller. Thank you so much, Jan. Jan is the best. Cam Miller, welcome. Get your emojis. Capri Suns in the chat. Buddy. We're gonna be buddies. We're gonna be pals. We're gonna wrestle our ass. <laughs> I don't think I will be getting rid of Chris Farley. That's for sure. SP seven thousand from eight hundred eight thousand feet in the Colorado Rockies. Thanks for being here. I don't know what the Rush D case is. I don't know if I will be covering it. I don't know what that is. Kelly, Kelly, Bowbelly gifting out a membership. Thank you, Kelly. Who's getting it? Fuck your life. Bing bong. Let's see who gets it. Sioux City Sue. Thank you so much. Because I'm going to fuck uh, with Kelly, you, Kelly, buddy. Kelly, Bowbelly. We're going to be buddies. I just got a We're coffee, gonna too. We're going to wrestle our ass. <laughs> Margaret Williams. Thank you so much, Margaret. Margaret says, looking forward to spending the day with J-Bo Nation. Thank you so much, Margaret. Margaret. Thank you for the coffee. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mandy Joe made... Oh, I got to save it first. Mandy Joe made a, a funny graphic. Let me show you guys this. You're not going to believe who has the same fucking tie, or maybe you will. Hold on. Open image in a new tab. Save image as check out who has the same fucking tie or very similar at least. Uh, Mandy made this graphic. Tony Bailey, a member for three months. Thank you so much, Tony. Suzanne gifting you, a membership. Buddy. We're gonna be buddies. We're gonna be pals. We're gonna wrestle our ass. <laughs> Suzanne, thank you so much for gifting that membership. Love vs. Money 68 gets it. Thank you so much. Awesome, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Because uh, I'm going to bunk with you, buddy. 
We're gonna be buddies. We're gonna be pals. We're gonna wrestle. Oh, look at this shit. Remember when when Harpootlian pointed his gun at someone? Pointed the the three hundred blackout. Look at these guys. They have the same Fuck freaking the bye. same freaking tie. Thank you, by the way, Mandy, for making this graphic. Is that wild or what? They have like the same tie. Tony Bailey gifting a membership. Who gets it? Caleb. Tony, thank you so much. I'm gonna bunk with you, buddy. We're gonna be buddies. We're gonna be pals. We're gonna wrestle oh. our ass. <laughs> thank you so much, Tony. Oh, we just got a ten dollar patron jade thank you so much jade make sure if you want to chat with us all day connect to your patreon to discord if you want to chat with the folks who are on there the pin video shows you how and i find it's easier to do on the computer personally thank you all so much for being here thank you for all these super and i just got a ten dollar venmo from janine Looking forward to the live stream today. This week has been great. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Thanks a lot, man. Who did this image? It was Mandy Joe, our awesome mod. She Look for her in the chat. She has 16 M's in front of Mandy. Thank you, Wildfire. I appreciate you guys so much. I love you guys. Thank you. The guy on the right is from the Alex Murdo Murdoch trial. I found out the other found out that from from Michael DeWitt. I've been pronouncing his name wrong the entire time. Alex Murdoch. This guy was his um, defense attorney, Dick Harpootlian, who's also like a state senator fucking guy waved a 300 blackout at the defense ca at the prosecution good morning shy girl good morning nora good morning gravity Yeah, he said tempting. Good point, Sarah. He said tempting. By the way, Sarah, thank you for clipping, clipping, clipping my reaction yesterday. I always feel weird posting videos kind of where I am the reacting. I did do it for that one video. I, I mean, I have done it, but I feel weird doing it. Anyway, Sarah, aspiring court reporter, shared my reaction on Twitter. Thank you so much for doing that to uh, Del Boca Vista expert. Nothing like having to figure out what to say for a half hour because court doesn't start on time. Hit that like button, folks. Like, share, subscribe. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Helen says, my reactions are the best point. Thank you, Hel thank you, Helen. <laughs> Story time with Jay. Does, it, does anyone have any questions about um, any of the things we... Obviously, the, the Capri Suns are kind of a inside thing since the beginning. Does anyone have any... Um, questions about any of the inside jokes maybe that we have in the chat while we're doing this caleb new remember to jb and just want thank you guys for the am amazing community you have created you do so much great work and are truly an inspiration thanks jay wow caleb that was really so nice that makes me want to cry thank you so much caleb thank you so much that was really kind thank you for being here Serena gifting out a membership. Fuck your life, bing bong. Who gets it? Thank you so much, Serena. Who's going to get it? Did someone get it already? Gravity gets it. Serena, thank you so much for gifting out that membership. That was very kind. Because I'm going to bunk with you, buddy. 
We're going to be buddies. We're going to be pals. We're going to wrestle the rock. <laughs> You're not, don't worry, Elizabeth, you're not late. We are, they haven't even started yet. And again, if you're coming in late, once we start closing, Bob Mata, Karen Smith, Lisa Stabman, all going to join me and watch the closings together. <laughs> Let's talk Grandma Gotti. <laughs> What's up, MH? That's Donnie, Jesse Charles. That's Donnie. He's, whoops. Um... Suzanne says, really great community. We're proud of our community here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. There's Lisa. She's going to be joining us for the closings with Karen and Bob. We've been so lucky to have Karen and Lisa in the chat. All this trial, giving us the breakdown, giving us the info. It'll be nice to watch the closings. And then once they're done, kind of break it down. Uh, I could show, I will show the beginning of the Ackles clip, just not the whole thing because I don't want to get a copyright claim, but I will show Lisa sent me an email. If you guys missed this clip, I'm going to show the beginning of it, but listen to what Ackles says. This guy, uh, what's his first name again? Dustin. Let me find it. Listen to what this guy says. Uh, I'm going to, Tamara, I'm going to do a poll after the closings about what people think about. Uh, good morning, Deborah. And uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. I'm just going to show the beginning of this clip, guys. Listen to what this guy says. Not. <laughs> not, not Jensen. I'm an idiot. All right. Hold on. Hold on. All right, watch, watch what this guy says in his police interview. Listen to, imagine, just to, take a second back and imagine you are Jensen Ackles' publicist. And this is what he says. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott, Mandy Bobandy, keep shooting your shot, Jay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Randy. That was really kind of you. Thank you. Why is this not working? Hold on, here we go. All right, let's play this. Here we go. This guy's talking about losing the movie? A woman died? He's talking about losing the movie? Are you kidding me? Morning the movie? Are you shitting me with that? Was there no sound on that? Oh, there was no sound. That's my fault. Hold on. Sorry, guys. I'll play that again. I had it muted because of my stupid noise. Here we go. I'll play that again. Sorry. Here we go. We all lost this movie together, so we're mourning that too, which is it's tough. It's a, on a variety of levels. I mean, part of me wanted to just come back just to like, like I, I, I think I'm going to try to go out to the ranch today because I just want to like say goodbye. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This guy's mourning the fucking movie ending. Can you believe that's that's what he says as an in, in his interview? Um. Again, thank you so much, uh, Mandy Mandy Bo Bandy. That was really kind of you. Thank you so much. Joe Jackalone is here. What's up, Joe? I, I stopped by the morning show early. I was editing a video, but Joe has a new morning show, folks. Make sure to check it out. Let me share Joe's links here. Roll call. There it is. Make sure you subscribe to Joe Jackalone. Guys, does it make sense for me to put the chat on the screen when we're just on YouTube? I can do it. I, I'll put it on there.
Karen said, uh, Lisa says you can go to 3533. All right, let's see what he says at 3533. Thank you, Lisa. Let's see what he says about, by the way, this, this is from Crime Circus Cult, the channel. So if you want to check them out. He, he has like every, he gets, uh, he must be the FOIA king because he gets like every, every interview this guy gets. I don't know how he does it. All right, let's see what he says. Thank you, Lisa, again. He asked me, um, do you have any, uh, what, what level is your experience? And in, in kind of a, not a joking manner, but just kind of wanted to see where she was on the, on the level. Mm -hmm. I said, let's just assume not much. And so, and she, she said, okay, this is how you load it. This is how, we, this is how we check it. This is how, you know, the gun work, this is the trigger. This is the handle. I'm like, okay, okay. Just kind of playing dumb. And she said all the right things. Um, but it was more of just kind of an explanation. Uh, I don't know that there were a lot of safety measures that were explained to me, but it was just more of, this is how, this is what a gun is. This is there weren't a lot of safety measures explained to me. That is that good? No. All right, let me just make sure we're not missing anything. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. And she goes, um, if this is the one you like, I'll, I'll load it up. This guy is a co-star in the movie. He was also in Supernatural, and I think he's in The Boys now. Some, uh, some rounds, and you can just fire it off into the hill there. I said, okay, great. These are dummies. Uh, no, sorry. These are blanks. We're not, we're not live rounds at all. Um, so I think we were using, uh, half loads. Okay. Um, and so I put my gun belt on and I took my, I took the pistol and she, she took it. She walked it out to this, you know, uh, to the firing line, uh, heavy stand looking, facing down range. Uh, and then she sorry, I keep pausing it. I just don't want to miss anything. She, she loaded in uh, a full barrel, a full, uh, full wheel, six shots of uh, half loads. So I took it, uh, put it in my holster, and then, uh, kind of a dick thing for me to do, but I did like a quick draw and did <laughs> spun it and put it back in. <laughs> and the whole cowboy thing? Full on. Yeah. That's a good thing to joke about. Full on, did, did, even did the spin, spun the gun. Like, the well, she just goes, "Okay, asshole." Like <laughs> you could have told me that you knew how to handle a gun. Um, and so we laughed at that. And then she basically was like, "You're good. Get out of here. Give me your gun." So when you guys that. went down to do the practice shots, was it just solo? Did you guys have any other people <clears throat> with you? There were, yeah, there was a whole group of people. There was. Uh, Producers there. There was uh, props was there. Uh, Sarah and uh, I can't remember the other, her assistant. I can't remember her name. Um, she was there. Uh, Hannah was there. Uh, but when you went down to shoot, when, oh, I, when I went to, to fire down range, there was I was the only person. Everybody else was <clears throat> behind me at the tables. Okay. So we stepped out around. I, I stepped around the table, walked out probably a good ten paces. And then aimed away from everybody. They were all of my like six. Okay. Um, who was watching the guns while she would take? While she was with me, mm -hmm. props. Okay. And what about the ammo? That would have been all sitting right there in front of him on the table. Nobody was touching. Do you recall on the table what the, you know, the rounds, the blanks were in, and what color of box? Uh, no. I want to say I saw a white tray with just you know like a fifty round kind of tray of of, of rounds. Um, I know that she had a variety because she did. And I'm muted again. The, the sheer, I I've used the word laissez faire, but the sheer. Just casual attitude in these interviews with Hannah, with this guy. Like, it's just wild to me. You're you're being 
like even if he, obviously he's not a suspect, but like I don't know. She did say that uh, she was like, "You want to start with quarter loads, or do you want to do half loads?" And, and I think I said, "Let's go full loads." And she's like, "No, we don't have full loads. Those are too expensive." And I was like, "Ugh, low budget films." <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, low budget films. <laughs> you guys know about low budget films. <laughs> Oh, ugh, low budget films. Oh, you know, where someone died. Jeez. Jeez. Wow. Imagine being that guy's publicist. You think they were happy when that came out? Don't know what's going on today, folks. What's up, Morgan? Um, uh, Donnie, don't worry. Heather, who had to tell everyone at the end, what did she say? I forget what Heather said at the end about me not being respectful to my subscribers or something. I don't remember what she said, but uh, Heather was uh, blocked, Donnie, so you don't have to worry about it. Lisa says he also talks about how he took a private plane in because it's such a long drive and then took 15 minutes of talks of how he usually flies in a jet wild n wild zero self awareness zero oh i was rude oh i guess i am kind of rude sometimes what can i tell you folks if you're coming in late first of all thanks for being here second of all we're just waiting waiting for the court to be ready uh my followers are rude and so am i yes 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 um Again, when the closing starts, whenever that will be, Bob Mata, Lisa Statman, Karen Smith, make sure you are checking out their links, by the way, um, checking out Karen's podcast, checking out Lisa's book, both their Twitters, please, please, you know, they have, they have been so kind to, to share their time with us, follow them on Twitter, give a listen to the podcast, give it five stars, check out the book. Uh, Lisa's book. Serena says they're all coming in the courtroom. Not sure why they're not. We're on live. Nice, Irene. Irene just made some more friends on the Twitter. Actually, boots. Brienne said she might be going. Our boots on the ground. Brienne said she's probably going in today, folks. So we might have some insider information from the courtroom. <laughs> I should have gave her some banana bread, Beachy Stacy. Alec Baldwin's trial is in July. I think the middle of July. That'll be interesting. I hope we'll... Of course, I will be covering that. Will the next witness point a gun at the judge? You just never know. P 
Catherine, thank you. Catherine says, Twitter says arguments regarding closing happening now and not allowing broadcast. I don't get that shit. If a, if a case is allowed to be live streamed, the whole thing should be live streamed. Why do they get to pick and choose what they can show? Every Almost every other trial we've ever watched shows the arguments. Why are we not? Why are they not showing it? I don't. I, I think that's bullshit, in my opinion. The whole point is that we're supposed to be able to see what's going on, so there's no shenanigans going on. Although there's been a lot of shenanigans going on, but like, cause they fight good. Let's see them fight. We should see them fight. We've seen them fight all all freaking time. We're we're waiting. We there guys, if you're coming in late, absolutely nothing has happened yet. Apparently they're arguing about uh what's going on right now. Arguments regarding closings. By the way, I wonder if they're uh timed. I wonder if they're timed closings. That'll be interesting. That's true. Judge Mom does not understand court TV. That's a good point. I mean, if you know, depending how long this witness is and how long closings go, they might send them home. I mean, I guess I, I mean I don't know. I just have no idea how long this is gonna be. Yes, hit that like button. Thanks for being here. What's up, Donna? Uh, I think they're calling someone. They said they said yesterday that they were calling someone. That's true. It is boring, but this is causing me to now have to <laughs> think of what to say. All right, so <laughs> why don't we watch while this? I'm gonna keep this on. While we're waiting, instead of watching this, why don't we watch Del Boca Vista's testimony again while we wait? Well, oh, that's the part where he points the judge, the gun at the. All right, so just someone tell if it does go live, someone please tell me if I'm not paying attention to it. Look at this fucking guy. Remember when he talked about how he was friends with George Washington? And pheasants with my own. By the, by the way, guys. By the way, here's one thing that I was thinking about. That <laughs> about this guy. Here's something I was thinking about with this guy. He wore a holster. He was plan he wore his fucking thing. He was planning I have a feeling he was planning on doing the move, the cross body pull or whatever it's called and he never got to do it. He's probably so bummed about it. Look at him. He's got the thing on. He really wanted to do okay, it. Okay, sir, good afternoon. Can you please tell the jury your name again? Frank Lewis Blair Kuski the 3rd. Where do you currently reside? Carmel Valley, California. Austral. And what do you do for a living, sir? I'm managing director of Blair Financial Group. My <laughs> Can you imagine this, guys? What do you do for a living? I'm a manager of a financial group. Oh, okay. Tell us about guns. Hey, managers. Uh, why don't you, um, outside of your management in Blair Financial, to tell the jury um, about your experience with period firearms. Here's the part where he juggles all his papers because who doesn't like to hear a bunch of papers? This is so hilarious. He's like, let me check my notes. Yes. Um, I, prior to, let me check a note to make sure dates are correct. Um, I took part in my uh, first uh, movies in this, which were done with... Uh, and, and I'm not 
And of course, of course, she's like, objection, what the fuck? I'm not talking about the movies. Oh, uh, let me just, oh I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, let me just try to center my question. I, yeah. I'm still objecting. Okay. I'm still objecting. <laughs> objection, the judge is like, what's the reason? She's like, what the fuck, that's the reason. What the fuck, who is this guy? Just wait till, just wait until I show you guys the comparison with uh, Lucian Haig. I mean, it's insane. Uh, like, who are you going to listen to? This guy or Lucian Haig? You have your experience with firearms. And not necessarily getting into movies yet, but your experience with firearms and period firearms and how you obtain that familiarity. Do you wish for the long explanation or the short? No, the short. <laughs> the short's <laughs> right. always better. My father was a combat MP in the Second World. This is the short explanation. That's hilarious, too. By the way, he told that joke to say it. Clearly, there's only one version that he has. He doesn't have a long... This is the long version. War, I was shooting almost from birth. I was sent to rifle camp. In this man says, do you want the short version or the long? He says short, and then he talks about his birth. Butte, Montana, at age six, which is hard to imagine. Age six. I this is the short version. Grew up around a hunting family. My grandfather was a big time hunter. I grew up hunting deer and pheasants. By the way, at this point, balls in his head is like, oh my God, what have I fucking done? With my uncle in the forests of Ohio, I had Ohio. And the forests of Ohio, sir, sir. Indiana and Pennsylvania hunting licenses ever since they were required. I was a member. Uh, I was a Boy Scout rifle merit badge winner. I what a merit badge. Worked um, <clears throat> was a member of the Kenyan College of Rifle Team. Following uh, graduation from Kenyan College, I. Uh, took up firearms in a very serious way, beginning collecting and shooting. I was trained by Louis Tenenbaum. Uh, I love Lu I love the name drop of Louis Tenenbaum. Louis Tenenbaum. Let's essentially let's let's look up Louis Tenenbaum. We're gonna find some black and white photographs. Um, well, let's let's. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Whoops. member of the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit who thought I was worth taking his time with that. I appeared in... Uh... You know, Linda says, and I got a comment yesterday that someone was like, you guys are being mean. I get it. But at the same time, this man got paid a lot of money to do this testimony. Like, I kind of feel bad, but I kind of don't. Should I feel bad? Should I not be doing... <laughs> number of little television shorts and things like that through that time period. And when I really got going on primitive firearms, and I won't even talk about self-defensive guns at this point, I was trained yes, right. in combat guns. Um, I first appeared in the George Washington television miniseries in 1984, and I was assigned my role as a, a surveyor in the wilderness. And of course, I had my first real flintlock in my hands at that time. I, during the earlier times, had shot a lot of primitive weapons, prim primarily flintlocks, uh, black powder stuff. I was very interested in that. After that, I got going and I joined a group called the First American Regiment in 1985, which was the premier uh, late 18th century, early 19th century reenactors for military reenactment. And during this time, and I believe you have a nice picture of... Hi, hi, Kathy. Nice to meet you. This is hilarious, by the way. He's like, I believe you have a nice picture. Hold on, let's... ...me firing cannons. I, I believe you have a nice picture of me firing cannons. He was like, can you show... That was him being like, are you going to show the picture of me firing cannons? I became a sergeant of artillery doing reenactment. This fucking guy, man. Oops, this is not on live. Still nothing, folks. Sorry, I don't... Big time. And in that capacity, I appeared in lots of movies. I fired artillery. This is 18th century artillery. I fired at the 1812 Overture with Cincinnati Symphony in various performances in big stadiums and things. I also... Um, <clears throat> Sorry for the cough. I also answered questions for NBC Nightline fairly routinely on weapons identification Thank because, you, of course, I'm a fairly good expert in Russian weapons and one of the largest collectors in the United States. I took part with First American Regiment in 
many, many, many different film productions, television productions, that sort of thing, which were done by PBS and uh, I believe the History Network. These were uh, shown at the time on television and also became educational movies programs. They sold the rights to us, charging with bayonets to all kinds of ad agencies. I, okay, let me stop you for a second because yeah. there's a lot of information. And yeah. That's the moment where Bowles is like, I done fucked up. I got to stop this guy because he is not getting to the fucking point and he has lost the plot. Uh, by I'm the sorry. way, I forgot what I should have done in the beginning. Babe just texted me and then I... I Let's see what's going on. We have boot, we have not boots on the ground. A journalist, I forget who shared this with me. Thank you. This is what's been going on so far. Day eleven, the defense will call finishing. Will finish calling witnesses today. Uh, judge going over jury instructions on intent. State will not include general intent instruction. State has concern over defense closing arguments language they plan to use about the improper intubation of Helena Hutchins. Doctor testified the cause of death was the gunshot. State wants to prevent the jury from hearing that improper intubation could have been a cause of her death. I see some movement. All right, let me keep going. Um, judge looks over transcript of doctor's testimony. HH had been intubated incorrectly, sending oxygen to the stomach. Doctor said she could not opine that H. A. Helena would have survived if she had not been intubated. Judge, you can say she was intubated, but the doctor did not make the conclusion that H. H. Would have, Helena would have survived. Judge wants defense to include full scope of doctor's testimony. Court now replaying doctor's testimony. Bowles and the judge disagree on what the doctor said. Judge says Bowles has only taken a portion of the doctor's testimony and re leaving out the rest. Going over jury instructions and verdict form. Um, prosecution wants to mention that jurors have to be unanimous on involuntary manslaughter charge, but not unanimous on the three alternative theories. Judge ruling jury instructions are as they, as they stand are sufficiently correct. We do not need anonymity on the theory court taking a break before the jury brought in. That's 44 seconds ago. There you go. That's what's been going on folks. That's what's been going on. All right, so if they're on break, might as well play this. numbers it sorry, is absolutely the sound. identical sorry. any part sorry. would even change sorry. and it will look sorry. exactly like sorry. the Baldwin gun. Sorry. Did you sorry. also bring a, a replica gun? With yes you? I did. And can you tell the jury just first of all what, sure. what that is? This is a Denex replica. Denex is a company in Spain that makes replicas of anything from shotguns to anti antique weapons to swords, things like that. They're used by rain actors, they're used in movies. Uh, there was a Denex revolver on the set of Rust that was used as one of the dummy guns. There were in fact 10 non-firing replica guns on the set uh, that looked like this. Um, so it can't shoot, but it looks like it. It functions, it cocks the cylinder turns, and from five feet away you couldn't tell unless okay. you really looked. Okay, sir. Uh, let me, if I can. Yes, I was going to uh, ask at this time, Your Honor. If, if you're coming in late, you have not missed anything. They haven't started yet. Apparently, they were discussing jury instructions. If I could tender him as an expert in the categories I previously did. Well, why don't you state him on the record yeah, again? Yeah, I was making sure I had the exact wording. Is that okay if they. Again, it's fire of ammunition. And clarify that it. Do it in public, and I will clarify that it is not. By the way, you'll see in the video I made. Do you remember Lucian Haig's fucking thing? He had the. He had a, the suitcase with the foam. Look at this guy, how he's fucking carrying his guns. 
Okay. The first is a real. Mr. Kiski, are you able to uh, take the cylinder out so you can show everyone also that it's it's unloaded? Yes, I can. Okay. By the way, the court officers court officers knew immediately when they saw this man talking that they had to take action because if you'll remember with Lucian Haig, they did they weren't there. You didn't see court officers when Lucian Haig was testifying. And here is a Genex revolver. So, Your Honor, I'm going to object. All right, first of all, everybody's nervous because you have not demonstrated to us that they are unloaded. So before you start showing us the weapon... Can you imagine the judge said that to him and then he pointed his fucking gun at the judge? Make sure they're unloaded, including that one that you just touched. By the way, big props to this this officer, this court officer who was paying attention. He's <laughs> just fucking wild, man. Lucian Haig was the state's weapons expert who was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks for being here, everyone. If you're coming in late, they have not started yet. They were ar arguing during instructions. I'm going to try something to see if this could fix the noise. No, never mind. That's not going to work. God damn. All right. It's not. I assume at 930 they're going to be back. Let's see. Nope. And here's the part where he starts explaining to the jury what's going on. He's not on the record and there's no audio. And he starts talking to the jury. <laughs> this next is the replica that's not firing. That is obviously clear it cannot fire, correct? Yes, I wish to demonstrate Okay, but uh, just uh, let me let me lead the questions. Sure. Um, the other Pieta, you cleared with the deputy, but I want you to be able to take that cylinder out so we can show everyone it's clear. Is that absolutely? Okay. Gun is pointed in the same direction. Now, if we can get this pin out, the cylinder is retained. The cylinder is retained by a pin. Once that pin is removed, the gun may be put in a partially cocked position. The cylinder may be pushed out, and again, the barrel's safe, right straight through it. Sir, would you take that and show them all? It's empty. Is that acceptable? It's up to the court. No. Yes. Okay. No, the deputy is no. not involved no. in okay. this. Okay. That was hilarious. He's like, deputy, can you take this and show it to the jury? The judge is like, get the fuck out of here. That's not his job. And so it, it is empty. I demonstrated it's empty. Okay. okay. May I return it to the yes. firearm? <laughs> this guy, man. Oh, boy. Sorry, guys. I wish the court would have started already. Now he's struggling to get the gun together again. This is a good look. Can you imagine Bowles right now? He's waiting to ask him a question, and this guy can't get the gun back together. <laughs> okay, sir. Now, the first thing I want to ask you, um, comparing the Denix, the replica, to the real, the, the Pieta, do they share some of this? No, the defense is supposed to call a witness today, folks. Same characteristics. Yes, they do. And can you tell the jury, is the Denix made to look like the Pieta? Absolutely. And side by side, uh, if you can... And Your Honor, may he step down to show the, the jury? Yes. Okay. 
Sir, so if you can show them the Pieta and the Denex side by side, just so they can see. This is a Denex. It is a replica, totally unfired. Again, look at the court. Bear. Look at the deputy. He is not leaving this man's side. He's like, this guy's going to shoot someone. It is a replica, totally unfiring with a blocked barrel. Oh, just got a super chat from Linda. That spoiled little brat, who had three hours to check that gun, is entitled to zero sympathy. Think of the poor lunch lady. Thank you so much, Linda, for the super chat. Thank you. It's completely like a regular revolver. The cylinder turns, it will cock, it will snap and fire. It's unable to fire any ammunition. It's used as a replica. It's made of metal and it functions just like a single action army Colt, but it can't fire. I'll bring the next one and then we'll compare them. Next gun in the safe position. This is a P-80 revolver. This is the sister gun to the Baldwin gun. It's a 45 caliber single action 1873 revolver like was issued to Custer's troops. It is a true 45 long Colt. We call it just Colt, and it was designed for the U.S. Army to be able to kill him. By the way, the one thing I should have done in my video that I didn't, I should have done a meter that showed balls progressively getting redder as this man was his, as his man was, uh, as this guy was testifying. We call it testifying. Colt, and it was designed for the U.S. Army to be able to kill a man and a horse. And it was the most popular firearm Thank in you. Western Thank movies. Thank you, Mr. Kuski. If you could... Now may I show the two together? Uh, yes, if you will just show what, but not with that, not with testimony, but just showing them. I'll reverse them. Nothing like being an entire hour late. That's great. I guess they're not late. Well, Mr. Kiske, in your review as an expert in this case, are you aware whether there is a there was a Denex revolver like that on set on Rust? Yes, there is. It was covered in the in, in the invoices as rented by Rust Management. Now. Not demonstrating at this point, but you, can you tell the jury, based on what you just showed them on the Pieta, how you safely decock that firearm when you get uh, it cocked? You wish me to pick up the gun and show how it is decocked? I would prefer first showing on a Denex to them yes. and then on a line. Just show. Don't. Can you approach? Like, where did he find this fucking witness? And he apparently uses them every time. Now first, the finger has to stay off of the trigger and outside of the trigger guard, no matter what. That's the essential rule of safety. The firearm is cocked with your thumb, you see. Finger's still outside of the trigger. No one touches any trigger. This is now a gun capable of being fired. Now, the first thing I do here is put my thumb on top of it. If I'm not real strong, I put two thumbs on. Notice my finger is still completely off the trigger. I then slowly, gently pull the trigger and lower the hammer onto the cartridge. I then back it up to its safe position. Now I will demonstrate this. By the way, do you think anyone listened to this man after he pointed his gun at the judge? You got primer, you got a good, you need so I take a
Pat, I can't believe this shit is happening. Uh, yet another objection. Withdraw that question. The questions I have. I thought that was pretty hilarious when he's like, yet another objection. And the ejection was sustained, so he was wrong, and he's bitching about it. Sir, I'm going to uh, yet another objection, withdraw that question. And I, that's all the questions I have. Cross the chance. Uh, Mr. Kuski. Do you agree with me that basic gun safety requires that the handler of the gun not point the gun at anyone? If it's a real gun, yes. Do you agree with me that while you were sitting here in the courtroom, uh, you and you pointed it at the judge? I do not. You disagree? I pointed the gun into this space up here, never directly at the judge. Do you agree that basic gun safety requires that you uh, keep the muzzle of the gun pointed down for safety? Not at all. A gun may be pointed. As any well, this is cool, Mike. This is glitching now. This is wonderful. Education class. All right, I'm turning that off. Sorry, guys. I don't know why that shit was glitching. This is my nightmare. Let me see if there's any further tweets from journalists there. No, the last tweet was jury court taking break before the jury's brought in. That was 15 minutes ago. They're taking a break. When are they taking a break till? Good question. I wonder if the I wonder if the gallery will be packed today. I I would assume it's more full than usual, particularly with uh journalists and stuff being there. Thank you, MH. Thanks for being here. <laughs> they better not take a break till lunch. This is insane. Our boots on the ground are not there right now. The gallery and the jury should have, and the ju everyone should have. Well, if that guy's not there, I think we're all right. But just checking to see if I see anyone else tweeting about this or what's going on. Still nothing. What the hell, man? Wait a second. Wait a second. That can't be. Hmm. 
No. I don't know what's going on. <sighs> Sorry, guys. We've lost about 100 people watching, so that's fun. This is just wonderful. What's up, B-Rabbit? Thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks for everyone who stuck, stuck it through here. That's true, Cabo. That is true. Very loyal. And I'm very grateful for it. All right, I guess um, two witnesses. Serena says two witnesses. All right, thank you for the info. There might We might not have closings until uh, after lunch then if there's two witnesses. Morning to you. This is pretty funny. Someone just bought a super chat on Law and Crime that says, I am not the Sarah Zachary from the trial. <laughs> I am not the Sarah Zachary from the trial. That's Bob Opedic. Uh, all right, everybody. Uh, hold on a second, folks. We might have a special guest. You good? Bob, you good? You good? Bob, guys, Bob's here. Bob's just setting up, I think. I don't think he can hear anything. Are you talking to me, Bob? Hold on. Let me see if I can get Bob. Hold on. Uh, assign to, he's here. All right, let's see if I can, let's see. Bob, you good? Yo. What's up? Yeah, so my sound, can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. All right, so my sound is coming through my son, uh, my Thunderbolt display, like one of my second screens. Do you know how I switch it so it's coming through my headphones? Uh, on the top, you're, on your... you're on a Mac, right? Yeah, I'm on a Mac and it's uh coming through. The sound the, is coming through my Thunderbolt instead of my headphones. Like, so I can hear my mic through my headphones, but I can't hear you. So if you go to the top, um, like, there's, like, two – the top right next to the clock, there's, like, two little, uh, like, on-off things. You see that on the top bar? It looks like um, – it's where you can see oh, your Wi-Fi and stuff. Oh, on my Mac? Yeah. Okay. If you go to yeah, sound – Yeah, I see those. If you go to sound, click on that. You, you should be able to switch it, maybe? Sound. All right, let me see. And then click on the little oh. like circle thing next to it. Does that change it? Say something. Test, test, test. You're a fucking genius. You're there you go, Bobo. Genius. Wow, what a guy. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> what a guy. Ah, oh, dude, of course. Thanks for having me, man. Of course, guys. I've been missing you. I, was telling you. I know. It's been, how long? We haven't done a stream together forever. Um, 
know. Guys, it's been if you're not subscribed to Defense Diaries YouTube, do it now. Podcast, all the things. If you're new to the channel, we got a bunch of new people. So please uh, check out Defense Diaries YouTube. Um, the podcast, of course. Give it five stars. So, Bob, have you been paying? I know you were on your cruise. By the way, it was Allie's birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Allie. Have you like paid attention yeah, to any of this? What's going on? Uh, a little bit. I've been, uh, I watched some of your streams, uh, after the fact replay crew. Um, so I watched, a, I've watched a few witnesses. I mean, I, I have a pretty basic understanding of what's going on with the case. So, but like kind of fill in the, um, did the defense do anything worth a shit in terms did, of, did you see what happened like, yesterday? No. Uh -uh. So first, so, so the, they called, uh, three or four witnesses. The first two were OSHA reps basically saying the set was a nightmare they were trying to just say this it was an absolute bunch of problems it was the fault of rust not the fault of uh hannah so it's bob they call this gun expert we were just watching I i'm gonna show you bob because you're not gonna fucking believe it hold on let me see if i have this set up uh i'm gonna show you what happened yesterday while we wait folks again we are waiting for the court to start there apparently might be two witnesses today um, you're not going to believe they, so they bring him this, this gun expert, alleged, and, uh, watch what he does. This guy, and by the way, the state's Paul. gun expert was insanely qualified, oh, amazing. Point. Watch what he does. Let me get back to the point where he does it. So he immediately comes to the stand. They introduce him. He, they, he, watch, watch this, watch, you're not going to believe this. Oh, I saw your, I saw your short of this. <laughs> he points the gun at the fucking <laughs> judge, your... Bob. He points the gun at the judge. Oh, Jay. Jay, I have a terrible, terrible story. Uh, in an attempt murder case, Allison and I were trying. Um, I accidentally did the same thing. From you did the same court. thing? Yeah, I like, I didn't point it at the judge, but I had the gun in my hand, and uh, you know I think I I think I swung around, <laughs> and like you know it was it was a big deal. Everyone was like, Aah! I mean, obviously there was no ammo in it, but still, you know, it's like uh, I'm not you know I'm not a gun guy, man. It's like I, I've I, I've yeah. never touched a gun. I've never even touched one. Never taken any gun safety classes, you know. So um, they were all like. Whew. You can't point the gun at the fucking joy. They they were doing. They were like putting me on blast the same way that you're putting this guy on blast. <laughs> yeah. So, however, how I will say that we we did get a not guilty on an uh, attempt murder. So uh, nice. You know, it all worked. It all worked out for our client in the end. So yeah, that was their last witness yesterday, and this is how bad it was. So he he goes. State does cross, just annihilates him, and and the state is like. Did you just, is, is it gun safety? Did you just point the gun at the judge? He denies it, whatever. And then it goes to redirect, and he's like, no, I don't have any questions. He just lets him, <laughs> just lets him yeah. go. And, and yeah. the bailiffs don't even let him leave with his own gun. The, 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 they they take his bag and, like, <laughs> they take him oh from him. Oh, my God. They're it like, sir, really you are so much not an expert that we're not going to even allow you to leave with your own gun out of this courtroom. We'll mail it to you. When you're in the safety of your own home. <laughs> exactly. Wow. wow. So, yeah. I mean, that's bad because the guy's a fucking gun expert. I mean, me, I'm just a caveman lawyer. I don't understand your modern world. You know well, I mean? by the way, he, he, he introduces himself and then he's like, what do you do? He's like a financial guy who happens to have a pastime, like a side thing of like knowing about guns. That's not even oh, his, his side like, hustle is his yes, gun thing. <laughs> yes. He's like a financial advisor. Like he, he works for a firm about like has nothing to do with guns. Nice. To this yeah. state guy, Karen was in the chat, and she's like, "Oh shit, this is Lucian Haig. Like he is fucking legit. Like this guy was one of the best experts I've ever seen. Like he has a replica of the gun. He has it in a safe case. He, like he takes it out immediately, does it the right way. Like I made a video. I'm gonna premiere comparing the two witnesses, but <laughs> it was really it was bad. night nightmare. Well, so look, man, it can be tough to find experts. You know what I mean? It's like. It, I've had cases in the past where not necessarily gun cases, but like where, especially with medical experts, you know, if you've got a case where, um, you know, there's a question as to what was the causation of the injury and, you know, and it's been 
you know, we, we've had situations where it's been very, very challenging to find a witness that you could put on, you know, because it's like it, it's a little bit like that hired gun type shit that everybody's Dude. like, oh, well, you know, the states, it's their witness and, you know, they're getting paid by the state. So they're going to say whatever the fucking state wants them to say. And the same with the fucking defense guy. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, so it can be challenging. And I have a feeling in this particular case, because we all know kind of what went down with Hannah. That it was probably pretty challenging to find a witness to get up there. So they had to get a dude that, you know, had a side hustle as a gun expert, you know, I mean, and you're you see the language. results. That's what I did for 18 years was was I was the guy hiring the experts for the insurance company. And of course, yeah. every time I went to the trial, when, when it was up time for the plaintiff to go, they're like, all right, so let me just check here. You testified for Geico yesterday, the day before, like they just had a thousand cases and it, and it comes out like. As an adjuster, I have to like, like that's not a big deal. But of course, it's a big deal when all the person right. does is work, especially like IME doctors. I don't know if you guys know what independent, independent medical examiners. Basically, I don't know if this is the same by you, but in New York, how it works is, you know, you file your lawsuit, you go through discovery, and then there's a point where you have to go to an IME, to an independent right. medical examiner who's yep. supposed to like examine in you and make sure, determine if your injuries right. are cause or related, if you have any permanency, et cetera, et cetera. But when, when you're saying it to someone who you send it to all the time, the jury's like, and every single report they have says, this is not related. There is no disability. Right. The jury's like, wait, yeah. that's, that's all this guy says. So. Yeah, 100%, man. And, yeah, and just so people understand, that's Jay's talking about civil law. So, yes, like, if you is. have injuries and, you know, at car accidents and things of that nature, any kind of civil tort law. That's where you have the IMEs come in. Yeah, and it's, it's always the same thing. It's they're. They're IMEs, but they basically are, you know, hacks for the insurance company, <laughs> you know. Exactly. So it's like, and, and and we can bring that out at trial, you know. I mean, we can obviously say, oh, you know, so this is an independent medical examination. Well, how many times have you uh, performed examinations for whoever the carrier is, you know? And that, that kind of puts them on blast. But and you know, you what know the sometimes. Biggest thing was? Sorry, go ahead. No, it was go. I was just going to say the biggest thing that always got me, and I'm like, of course, that makes sense. They'll be like, and, and again, how long was your examination? And it's like 10 minutes. And they're like, so you're going to trust this guy who did a 10 minute examination as opposed to his primary care physician or his orthopedist who has been treating him the entire time, who says he has a disability, says he can't hold his arm this way. Like, but you're going to take it right. from this guy who saw him for 10 minutes. Like, that was always the killer. Right. Um, time always. To, time man. to settle. <laughs> Yeah, it, well, and it depends. It depends on the county, man. You know, there's some counties that um, are very, you know, conservative in terms of, you know, paying out judgments in, in cases like that, especially, you know, I mean, we would handle a fair amount of like soft tissue cases, you know, with basically whiplash, rear enders, you know, and I'd have clients that would be telling me like, you know, as we litigated it two and a half, three years down the road, they're like, yeah, I, like my neck's fucked up. Like I'm still in pain. And, and I would believe them. And, y y you know, from being uh, on the insurance side of it, it's like you're not really seeing anything on, on the CAT scans or the MRIs that is something that you could bring into court and say, OK, well, here you can see the injury, not you know, so it's like. Right. You don't have herniated discs. You don't have those things that you can like tangible things that you can see on a scan where you could point to the injury and say, look, this is what the injury was. So it was always, you know, like really tough to recover on those things. And it was one of those, you know, like where I, I always felt bad for the clients. I'm like, look, I tell them going in, I'm like, these are hard to recover on. You know, I mean, we might get the medicals, you know, but in terms of getting kind of pain and suffering and, and for future damages, it's tough to recover. And especially if you're in counties where that are conservative, like if you didn't get into Cook County where Chicago is, you can ring the bell on some shit, you know, because the juries are like, fuck, the insurance companies are going to make them pay, you know, and it's in like, New York. That's like the Bronx, Brooklyn, <coughs> uh, Staten Island are the big like if you, you go, you take a case in the Bronx, you better be ready to pay. I had a. Uh, right. I don't know if people are going to get to anyway. I had a case. It was an arthroscopic surgery, which isn't really a big deal. It's, it's not invasive. And like typically we would sell those cases for like 70 grand, whatever. In the Bronx, we go, we think we're doing good. 1.2 million verdicts. <laughs> we are so lucky we had an umbrella policy. But anyway, Karen Smith is in the chat <laughs> who has been watching with us and Lisa all the time. She says, I was a prosecutor's witness in my career, but if Bob told me the forensic was fucked up on a case, 
I'd listen and respect brother. So ah, uh, that goes both ways, Karen. You tell Karen me some is, shit. I'm 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 all with you, woman. You know that. Karen's whole point is, and I'm sure you'll agree with this. Whoever the witness is, and we we talked because we've had different witnesses, you know, kind of present differently. If you fuck something up, don't try to fight. Admit it. Say I could have done that better. Move on. Like some of these witnesses, like they get uh, angry, like they they want to combat about it, but like. You get more uh, credibility with the jury if you're just like, yeah, I messed that up, but this is what I did. And Karen's been all about saying that. Hundred percent, man. And and like some experts just won't do it. Like we had an expert, uh, not in the civil case, but in the Garcia case, that was a uh, kind of a world renowned criminologist. And we had put him on, and we're actually in this portion of the podcast right now, like during this hearing for where we were trying to sever the charges in that case, you know, because there were two sets of double homicides that took place five years apart and then this burglary charge which was not related to either of those and we were trying to separate those so that they weren't trying them all in the same case because they were trying to bootstrap these these charges onto one another you know which in a case can be tough because if if in one of the cases they have stronger evidence than they do in one of the other cases which where they didn't really have any evidence you know, and they're able to try them together. They then kind of bootstrap them. They they like latch on to the other charge that's got the stronger evidence, and it confuses the jury. And they're like, "Oh, well, you know, it looks like he did this one, so he probably did that one," which is bullshit. You know, so we put this guy on. His name was Brett Turvey. Uh, Brent Turvey, and like he had done like huge amounts of crime scene analysis and just forensic, uh, criminal forensic work. And, you know, and we were putting him on to show that there were dissimilarities between the two uh, homicide crime scenes, that they weren't similar because they had it as our guy was like a serial killer, that he had done this. And then he, you know, when he did it five years later, the crime scenes were so, so similar that that alone shows that that he had probably if he's the guy that he committed both of these. And so this guy was testifying <laughs> And, and 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 this was during a pretrial hearing, so it wasn't in front of a jury. And he he would not he like so in the courtroom that we were in, there was a big like picture picture window to the left of him. And so the states the the state attorney was questioning him. This guy for like three hours never made eye contact with with the state's attorney ever. Like it was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. Like he just kept looking out that window. Like he would, she would ask him a question, and then he'd just be looking out the window. We, it, it was so bizarre that we ended up deciding not to use him because we're like that will not play well with the jury. Like this guy, like he, like, you know, and she was attacking him. You know, she was attacking his credibility. So like, like I, I don't know if he was getting upset by it or or what have you. But after I'm like, hey man, is that like your? your typical like mo in terms of like when you're on the stand do you not make eye contact with with the state whoever's whoever's questioning you and he's like he's like yeah no not usually i'm like wow that's you know i didn't want to criticize him you know i was like wow that's it's unusual man but you know things like that you know kind of go a long way in terms of like trying to to figure out witnesses but that's what's fascinating it, to me by the way the strategy behind like for example it, it they had this witness, Bob, this guy, uh, not the guy who was the gun expert. They had a, a witness who was like an armorer, who was like a, he, he, this was like, he, he watched the back, behind the scenes footage. He was saying what they were doing wrong here and there. And I get that you like, there's scheduling conflicts, but like, to me, like you end with that witness. He was so good. Or even th the witness they ended on was this guy who supposedly made pictures look clearer, which he didn't. They were trying to prove that like the bullets that were in like the, you know, on the set were real. And it was just it was like a dud because he really didn't make it. Now, the what the witness they had on before that was Becca, the woman who basically that she tried to get rid of the coke with. So to me, if that's the same day and that's like if you're strategizing and with that woman who was basically saying the day that this happened, she's trying to get rid of of cocaine that she had on her. Don't end with the guy who's boring and no one's listening to like the strategy behind it is, is, is always so interesting to me. Always, you know, but sometimes the reality is availability of the witnesses. You right. know what I'm saying? So like sometimes we would have to put people where we would otherwise like to have them somewhere else 
based on their availability because the court doesn't give a shit. You know, if like like a lot of experts, they're you know they may have other cases they're working, they may have things going on personally, whatever the case may be, and they're like, well, I'm not available on that day. You know, because right. we get a general idea of when the trial is going to be, and then it gets locked in. And you know, we're, when we're trying to figure out a trial date, you know, with the judge. And we've talked to all of our experts and trying to coordinate all that shit's tough. I mean, right. you watch enough trials to know that sometimes there's issues with, yeah. with expert witnesses. And so trying to coordinate all that in a way that you can be able to put them in the order that you think best suits your case can be can be challenging. Well, and I have a feeling it was probably one of those things that, that happened with that particular witness. Speaking, you know, because if you put on somebody that you don't want, who's right. like kind of you know of a dud of a witness you know i mean you want to end strong right like right. whether you're the state That's or the defense end dud. yeah you want to you want to end strong if you can but sometimes you just you can't man well speaking of expert witnesses who are not duds look who we have join us karen smith is here how many cases karen over 200 cases karen how, how many cases <laughs> have up, you buddy? tested i mean this What's is up? an expert expert i don't know right? if it's my internet or what but it's all glitched oh no could you, are you here you all right I could hear hear talk, so we could see if you're you're glitching out. Do some voices for yeah, us. I'm, I'm glitching out. <laughs> I haven't seen. I'm glitching out. <laughs> oh, I, I we haven't seen Karen since our uh, our voice off. I haven't. Yeah, seen right. Her. That's right. And guys, guess yeah. what? Let hopefully that Karen could get in it because we have. Hold on a second here. Yeah. Let me hang up and try to ring back in. Hey Karen, if you've got anything else running, um, maybe shut it down. That's me. I'll, I'm maybe. just gonna switch my internet. I'll ring back in. I'll be back in a sec. Okay. Jade, you see me give some tech advice right there? It was pretty cool. I'm muted. Oh my god, I'm muted. Did you see who DM me, Bob? Wow. You no. saw? Tana no. DM me, Bob. What? Oh, I saw that on Twitter. I saw that on Twitter. Wow. What did she say? She said, quit talking shit. I had a video because there was a viral video about her phone number being named Gorilla uh, Grip Pussy Pal. You good, Karen? We oh, there's the fireworks from. <laughs> oh. Are you glitching or are you good, Karen? Bless America. Yeah. Alright, awesome. Here we go, folks. We're... So, yeah, Bob, here's the clip that the guy said. Alright, you need really seated. Good. good morning, jurors. Thank you so All much right, for your patience. Seated. Good morning, jurors. Thank you so much right, for your patience. Next witness. Two things. Alright. Jeremy Cole. Next witness. Did someone have this on or do I have this on? Oh, I. Sorry, guys, that's me. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth of the whole Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be You guys don't have this on, do you? Do I have this on two places? I, I, hear, I hear two of them. I'm trying One to of you guys out. have it on? Knowing, knowing me, I have it on somewhere. Let me see. Good morning, uh, sir. And you, please tell the jury your full name. Uh, it's Paul Peter so. Pesh Jr. Hold on, is this me? But uh, I've always been referred to I don't as have PJ a plan. Pesh. Mr. Pesh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I direct and write movies and television. How long have you been in the business of directing and writing movies and television? Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing. Movies. Uh, Thirty-five years. Can you give uh, do you the jury a background I don't think so. on your uh, movies that you've directed Hold on a second. in a, kind of a biographical sketch? Sure. How is this? Uh, I attended Columbia University. I mean, it's got to be uh, me, right? Studied under Martin <laughs> Scorsese I, I and did a short film that traveled around the world. Does I wound up getting a deal at Paramount in 1990. Um, I directed a Film for Roger Corman in 1991. Right there, it sounds good, that right? I wrote and directed in 1995. I directed a Western with Sam Elliott 
that we actually shot at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Do you have um, any other open tabs? <laughs> that was a also <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a shit ton of open short tabs. schedule. <laughs> so let me see. Uh, I've directed see. six feature films, and if you look at the top, one of them might have a speaker. Close on to a hundred hours of television. No. Um, I've created television shows, um, oh. written and sold movie scripts. Um, I've worked for Paramount. Uh, Warner Brothers, HBO, Universal, Fox. Anything else? I that, that's um, a really good background, and I, I just want to ask you with regard uh, to the western on Bonanza Creek. That's Is also still the site up? of, of where I, it must was be found. me. I don't have it on. Anymore. That's what I understand, Hold on, guys. Yeah. Well, Mr. Pesh, um, it sounds like you have experience also with uh, movies involving firearms. Yes, Lisa's um, here. many right, of I'm the television to shows on, and I think four Pesh. or five of the six films, two of them were westerns. All right, I got it, uh, folks. Sorry about that. That was me. Was I'm sorry for one of the sniper series. Come on, Jay. What the fuck, man? Uh, one of them was... I don't know how that happened. Uh, I was convinced it was Smoking me. Aces, which... Had Sorry, a it was a terrible amount of Lisa. gunfire. In your uh, work on the movies involving uh, gunfire, have you had the occasion Looks to like work a serious with man, Jay. and prop masters? Yeah, I have. And actually, in all of the movies you've done, I'm sure I'm certain you've worked with prop masters. Yes. Okay, sir. And, and with regard to those movies that you've directed in television, have you worked with uh, directors, first assistant directors, and understood people's roles on the set? I have. Okay. With regard to armors, have you ever worked on a prior film in which an armor had split duties as an armor and a props? I have not. With regard to uh, this situation where there is a uh, gun heavy set I will represent to you. Would you think, in your experience and what you've seen, it would be advisable to have a part-time armor doing two jobs? I would say that would be highly inadvisable. Whose responsibility is it to properly staff with regard Shoot. to the movie That functions? dude's head shine, man, though. Uh, the line Serious. producer or the unit, wow. the unit production Holy manager. shit. <laughs> Fuck. I mean, that's got to be a product, have a right? Set involving <laughs> He's got to put some kind of fucking shit be, on there. In your experience, possible for a part-time armorer to manage that? I wouldn't imagine so. Uh, Blinding. It's like staring into the one sun. One person can... Each one of those weapons needs to be tracked pretty consistently for the set to remain safe, so I don't see how a single person can... Keep their eye on 20 firearms. With regard to overall set <laughs> safety and your experience and background, who is in charge of that? The first AD is that was me shining considered my in all of the published safety advisories uh, the chief safety officer on the set. Are you a member of various guilds? I'm a member of the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, SAG AFTRA, which is the Actors Guild. And I also happen to be a member of the Musicians Guild. Okay, All so right. when you talk about safety rules, uh, are some of those from those guilds? Yes, there's a... I can't remember the name of the organization. But Sir, are you sort part of, of the uh, Lollipop Guild? Collectively represent all of the various guilds. And By the way, folks, anybody? sorry, I, I got to update anybody? the ticket. This is PJ Pesci, writer and director. Issue. So was he a he was a state witness? No, no, this is uh this is defense. Uh, is this current? Is this happening right now? Yeah, this is right now. This is live. Oh fuck! Sorry, I'll shut the fuck safety uh, that they recommend uh, attaching to the call sheet each day. Is it in your experience also um, something you've seen where there will be daily safety meetings on set, especially in a gun heavy set? Expert. Uh, yes, Your Honor. We, I believe, he can give lay opinions on his experience, but but also, we would tender him as an expert. I, I think we should approach. 
Thanks, man. By the way, Lisa and Karen, sorry I didn't introduce you guys. Thanks so much for being here. We got Lisa, Karen, Bob, everyone check them out. Um, oh, good. Bob, by the way, if you, ha if you, ha if you haven't been paying... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Kitty cam. Oh, the Hi, gato. Kitty cam. Gato. Gato Negro. Um, <laughs> Bob, they have, they, have, they have fought so much, the prosecutor and the defense, that... Now every objection has to be a sidebar. That's there was one day they got into it so much where the judge is like, "That's it. Every objection is a sidebar." <laughs> been there, been there. <laughs> so, Mr. Pitch, you were discussing some of those safety rules. Now, would it be, in your experience, advisable for uh, production to convene daily safety meetings? Yes, in fact, it's recommended by all of the published literature. Uh, by the guilds, um, and it's been my Molly they Pope they Pope. recommend that a safety meeting takes place any time uh, there's to be any stunts, firearms, special effects. But it's been my experience that in the last Lollipop. seven or eight years since the tragic incident with the camera assistant who was killed on the railroad bridge that every first AD I've worked with, regardless of what's happening that day, on the call sheet has a quick safety meeting just running over and reiterating <coughs> basic safe practices. And, and you as a uh, director, uh, is that something that you advise and you practice? I don't give safety meetings, that's the job of the safety officer, the first AD, but I think it's a great idea. In your experience in, in interacting with first assistant directors, if, for example, there's a situation where a set is rushing, there's safety issues occurring, does the first assistant director have any responsibility in that respect? Most definitely. And what would that be in your experience? What would, what would you expect to see happen? Um, my experience has been that the first has an announcement to everybody, slow down, this is not safe, or we're not doing this, or just takes charge. And uh, if there's a specific issue with a crew member, they'll pull them aside and discuss the issue and consult with stunts or props or uh, firearms and deal with it. Is that also true, for example, if you have a issue with an actor, uh, for example, uh, firing a blank after somebody yells cut, what would the first AD be expected to do in your experience? Uh, speak with them and indicate Look, when cut is called, uh, usually the only person that can call cut is the director. But if, if it's a safety issue, anybody can call cut. And once cut is called, everything needs to stop. Because if there is a safety issue, obviously, that somebody has noticed, nothing else should take place. So, yes, the first AD should speak to that performer. When it comes to safety, what is your view as to everybody's responsibility on set? Well, again, it's not just my view, but again, in the published literature of the, of the various guilds, they indicate safety is everyone's responsibility if there's a safety issue. There are anonymous hotlines for anybody to call and raise these issues. And are those uh, anonymous hotlines, are those published generally in your experience working on set? They are. Usually they're uh, with that safety recommendations that are attached to the call sheet. And those hotlines, uh, what are they? What did they provide for people to be able to do if they notice a safety failure? Uh, you can call the someone from your guild 
uh, each of the studios the has their there? own separate hotline. Um, uh, and as far as I know, that will allow you to anonymously, so you don't look. If you report something, you could put your career in jeopardy. Nobody wants to do that, but um, the idea is that a representative can provide that information to somebody who will take action, such as the producer, the UPM, or the first AD. In your experience, uh, have you worked and seen the interaction between prop masters and armors? I have. And can you tell the jury, in your experience generally, how they interact, uh, who's in charge of the firearms and who's in charge of the ammunition and then what the prop master role is? Well, the prop master, more often than not, hires the armorer because that's a subset of that department. But the armor is in charge of all ammunition, all firearms, um, maintaining them, uh, keeping them safe, and inventorying the ammunition. With those duties and responsibilities, would you believe it be to be important in your experience to accord the armor adequate time to do those duties? Yes. And would it be important to accord adequate resources uh, for that armor to do those duties. Yes. If there is a scenario where the um, armor is dealing with um, a gun-heavy set, not having those resources, who would you expect to assist that, that armor in getting those? Props. If there is a situation where um, there is a scene, a video, something's happening, and both the armor and first assistant director witness a uh, safety violation involving a, a weapon, for example, um, what would be your assessment whether one or both of them um, should say something about that? I would say both of them should say something about it and figure out why it happened and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay. Thank you, Honor. I have no further questions. Ooh, short. Cross exam. Way better than the last witness, I'll tell you that. Sir, how do you deal with lollipops that have gotten under Mr. Pesh, I just have a couple follow-up questions for you. Thank you for your time today. Certainly. Um, so anyone on the crew can stop filming due to safety concerns, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez? That's correct. Um, and. Sir, did you read or watch the statements of Ms. Gutierrez in preparation for your testimony? I did not. That was my understanding. Um, so, are you aware that on October 21st, 2021, um, Ms. Gutierrez was not inside the church with the gun, not because she was working on props, but because she was just doing some other armor duties? Objection, Your Honor. Time to approach. Didn't she have three hours to prep that stuff because of the walkout, Lise, Jay? Yep. Yeah, three hours. And everything he's saying is 100% correct, that anybody can shut down and call cut and shut it down. Anybody can go and raise concerns about safety and, and must be heard and validated. But we still go back to the fact that what the prosecutor just brought up, Gutierrez did not do this, A. B, neither did any of the people above her, nor Halls, nor anybody else around in safety. C, all of the crew that did raise concerns were completely ignored. And finally, she put the freaking bullet in the dead Do I need to well, restate the question? Well, was busy, you uh, yes, okay. you know, blasting uh, huge so rails as well. So my question for you is, uh, we. But we saw some some uh, 
interviews from Ms. Gutierrez, and, and she does uh, explain that she was not in the church because she was um, rails. preparing her fanny pack and her blank ammunition for the next scene. You agree preparing that that sounds cocaine. like armor work to, to, to you, not props work? Yes. Okay. Um, and are you also aware, sir, that on the morning of the 21st, when the crew was waiting for replacement camera personnel to arrive, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours uh, to work on her preparation for the scenes that day? I was not aware of that. Okay, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Uh oh. No, no, he redirected. I just, uh, uh oh. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Petschiff. There was um, a scene going on inside the church at that time involving Mr. Baldwin and the firearm. If Ms. Gutierrez Reed was not in the church, would you have expected someone to have called her back in? I would. If there's a firearm on set, there should be an armor on set. No, nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. It's also your thank you. to be watching those guns every second that they are taken out of that lawsuit. Council second. approach. You shouldn't need anybody to say, oh, hey, Hannah, we're using one of your guns that's already on the set, as Bob said, while you're doing rails in the in the bathroom. <laughs> Hold on, I have to process my cocaine. I'll, uh, I'll be in the trailer <laughs> for a little bit. Don't look for me. Wow. Don't shoot the guns while I'm trying to blow lines of uh, cocaine, please. Wow. I wonder yeah, so, I mean, their thing. strategy there was clearly to, you know, shift blame, blame shifting. You know, anybody could have called it, called cut, you know, and obviously um, she's the armorer, though. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, you know, I think it's in she my world. Every right uh, as any other crew member to have stopped it, you know, yeah. and that goes right back to these producers who hired somebody who can be bullied who can be told you're only going to get X amount of days as an armor, who is going to listen to everything that they think they're hungry. Next witness. Yeah. At this time, the defense rest. Oh. Okay, thank you. There it is. All right, so both there sides have rested. It's now my duty to give you the instructions of law. I'm going to read them to you, and then you will get a copy of the instructions, okay? The instructions I'm giving you are very helpful for the um, counsel to uh, use in their closing arguments, okay, which will follow. All right, so instruction number one, you have heard all the evidence. It is now my duty to tell you the law that you must follow in this case. Instruction number two, the law governing this case is contained in instructions that I'm about to give you. It is your duty to follow the law as contained in these instructions. You must consider these instructions as a whole. You must not pick out one instruction or parts of an instruction and disregard others. A copy of these instructions will be given to you when you- So real quick, I'm curious if you guys, if everyone is uh, questioning whether they didn't call uh, Thel Reed. Are you guys surprised by that? The he was involved. I'm surprised by the fact that they did not call one single witness in her defense as a character witness. Not one crew member, not one friend, not one person, not even her own damn dad. Not right. one character witness. And that tells you so much, doesn't it, Bob? Yeah, it does. It does. Did she testify? I'm assuming she no. did not. Yeah. Right. Hell yeah. No. I yeah. yeah, I mean, I, w I wouldn't have put her on with a million She's foot pole. not a sympathetic witness. She is not a sympathetic witness at all. No, no. And, and she, you know, she would have been in a position where how do you answer the question? You know what you I can't. mean? And it's like she would have had no answers for how how did a live round make its way onto the set? That's well, what I told I him. Was... This is not a self-defense case, so there's no reason for her to take the stand. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. You begin your deliberations. Instruction number three. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent unless and until you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of her guilt, his or her guilt. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not required that the state prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. The test is one of reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. 
the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. Instruction number four. You are the sole judges of the facts in this case. It is your duty to determine the facts from the evidence produced here in court. Your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence your verdict. You are to apply the law as stated in these instructions to the facts as you find them. All right, folks, just real quick, I put a poll in there. What do you think the jury's going to come back with? Answer the, check out the poll. All right, but and wait, way, wait. You decide the case. You got Before they answer the poll, does everybody understand what the statute is in terms of involuntary manslaughter in New Mexico? Uh, I don't, do you? Well, I do. I, I do. Well, so she's going to read an instruction, and when she does, um, we'll go through it. But So maybe do a poll ahead of, because I, look, I mean, they have to prove the statute. It's not what our gut feeling is. Like, you know, I mean, we have to see if they proved each and every element of the statute for involuntary manslaughter. So she'll get to that instruction. What she's doing now, and these are all what they call pattern jury instructions. So, you know, Same both everywhere. sides look at them. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, I mean, you'll, you'll, you know, every state has a different definition. And some, some states don't even have a definition of reasonable doubt uh, because it's very difficult to define. Uh, but, they'll definitely get to an instruction that has what the statute is um, because it, essentially when they get to the jury verdict form, you know, that that's going to be half, that's the question they have to decide whether or not the state met its burden in terms of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that they've met each and every element of the statute when they're done, when she's done with the instructions, I'll, I'll go through it again. I pulled it up from New Mexico. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Instruction number five, your verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each juror agrees. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty to consult with one another and try to reach an agreement. However, you are not required to give up your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but you must do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own view and change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of reaching a uh, verdict. You are the judges, judges of the facts. Your sole interest is to ascertain the truth from the evidence in this case. Instruction number six, each crime charged in the information should be considered separately. Instruction number seven, you must not concern yourself with the consequences of your verdict. Instruction number eight, you must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant did not testify in this case, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. Instruction number nine, you alone are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight to be given to the testimony of each of them. In determining the credit to be given any witness, you should take into account the witness's truthfulness or untruthfulness, ability and opportunity to observe, memory, manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in the case. Instruction number 10. You should consider each opinion received in evidence in this case and give it such weight you think it deserves. If you should conclude that the reason given in support of the opinion, the reasons given in support of the opinion are not sound, or that for any other reason an opinion is not correct, you may disregard the opinion entirely. Instruction number 11. An expert witness is a witness who, by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, has become expert in any subject. An expert witness may be permitted to state an opinion as to that subject. You should consider each expert opinion and the reasons stated for the opinion, giving them such weight as you think they deserve. You may reject an opinion entirely if you conclude that it is unsound. Instruction number 12. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction 
beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. 1. Hannah Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. 2. Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's actions. Action. 3. Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. 4. Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. 5. This happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October 2021. Instruction 12a. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter in count one alternative, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. Two, Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's action. Three, Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. Four, Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Five, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 13. For you, to define, for you to find the defendant guilty of neg negligent use of a deadly weapon as a lesser included offense charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. Two, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 13A, for you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the defendant acted with willful disregard of the rights or safety of others and in a manner which endangered any person or property. Instruction 13B, in addition to the other elements of tampering with evidence, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant acted intentionally when she committed the crime. A person acts intentionally when she purposely does an act which the law declares to be a crime. Whether the defendant acted intentionally may be inferred from all of the surrounding circumstances, such as the manner in which she acts, the means used, or her conduct. Instruction number 14. You have been instructed on the crimes of involuntary manslaughter and the lesser included offense of negligent use of a firearm as charged in count one. It is up to you, the jury, to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on the crimes charged in that count. However, to return a verdict, you must follow the procedure described in the next instruction. Instruction number 15. To aid you in your deliberations and in returning your verdict, you will be provided both guilty and not guilty forms for each of the charges for each of the crimes charged in count one. Unless you unanimously agree on a verdict, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. Although you may deliberate on the crimes charged in count one in any manner and order which you choose, you must return your verdicts for each offense in count one in the order they are instructed. Under this procedure, if you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you should sign the guilty form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense in count one. If after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense. You should only return a verdict on negligent use of a firearm if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you must sign the not guilty verdict form for involuntary manslaughter before returning a verdict on any other crime charged in count one. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, you should sign the guilty verdict for that offense. If you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense. 
Instruction number 16. In this case, as to the charge of involuntary manslaughter contained in count one, there are four possible verdicts. One, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Two, not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Three, guilty of negligent use of a firearm. Four, not guilty of negligent use of a firearm. You must consider each of these crimes. You should be sure that you fully understand the elements of each crime before you deliberate further. You have the discretion to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on this count, but you must return a unanimous verdict of not guilty on involuntary manslaughter before entering a verdict on negligent use of a firearm. You will first decide whether the defendant is guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then that is the only form of verdict which is to be signed as to this count. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you should sign only the not guilty form as to involuntary manslaughter. If, after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime, and you should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining crime. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you will then go on to a consideration of the crime of negligent use of a firearm. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, then that is the only form of verdict which should be signed. But if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of the crime of negligent use of a firearm, then you should sign only the not guilty form. If, after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. You may not find the defendant guilty of more than one of the foregoing crimes. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant has committed any one of the crimes, you must determine that the defendant is not guilty of that crime. If you find the defendant not guilty of all of these crimes in count one, you must return a verdict of not guilty as for this count. Instruction number 17. For you to find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant Hannah Gutierrez had a baggie of cocaine. Guys, we're a little behind. I'm going to speed it up a tad, just if you're wondering. Here we go. By asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel room. Oh, hid a baggie of cocaine. By asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel room. Two, by doing so, the defendant intended to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of Hannah Gutierrez for the crime of involuntary manslaughter. Three, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 18. A firearm means any weapon which will or is designed to or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the actions of an explosion, the frame or receiver of a firearm, any firearm muffler or firearm silencer. Firearm includes any handgun, rifle, or shotgun. Instruction number 19. In addition to the other elements of the crime of involuntary manslaughter as set, in for, as set forth in instruction number 12a, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt, doubt that one, the death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez's failure to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. Two, the act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside events, resulted in the death and without which the death would have not occurred. There may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. Instruction number 20. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's act was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. An issue in this case is whether the negligence of a person other than the defendant may have contributed to the cause of death. Such contributing negligence does not relieve the defendant of responsibility for an act that significantly contributed to the cause of death, so long as the death was a foreseeable result of the defendant's actions. However, if you find the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, then the defendant is not guilty of the offense of involuntary manslaughter. Instruction number 21. 
Now the lawyers will argue the case. What is said in, in the closing arguments is not evidence. It is an opportunity for the lawyers to discuss the evidence and the law as I have instructed you. The state has the right to argue first, the defense may then argue, and the state may then reply. Counsel? Here we go, folks. Here we go. Buckle up, buttercups. While they're setting this up, Bob, talk about like when you're set, when you're getting ready for closing statements. I mean, there's got to be butterflies. I mean, how many times have you practiced it before you? Uh, typically zero. Really? I mean, I, I prepare it. You know, I have an outline. I'm pretty good contemporaneously speaking. Um, I mean, I know the facts of the case, and, and I'll I'll give myself bullet points. I never read. I never read a closing. You know, you got to know your case. You got to know the facts of your case. You got to know the evidence. And you have to know what your arguments are. Okay. Thank you. I gave a four-hour closing in Garcia wow. with no notes. Yeah, it was, it was Good crazy. morning, ladies and gentlemen. Long one, Jay. <laughs> May it please the court, counsel. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for your time. I know that this has been a, a long trial, and um, I also understand that as jurors you find yourselves maybe a little frustrated. There's a lot of sitting around and waiting. Um, and uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the sacrifice that you make when you leave your jobs and your families and your other responsibilities and you come to court uh, to participate in a very, very important part of our justice system. So on behalf of the state of New Mexico, uh, we thank you very much for your time. And as you can see on your screens, we end exactly where we began, in the pursuit of justice for Helena Hutchins. I want to start by just generally outlining Hannah Gutierrez failed to maintain firearm safety, making a fatal accident willful and foreseeable. And please keep in mind that omissions can also be willful. So if we fail to do something that we should do, and that failure uh, results in someone's death, then that too uh, can be willful. So I would ask that you keep that in mind as we move through for the uh, some of the evidence and testimony that you have heard. I know that you have heard a lot, and I do not intend to keep you too long, uh, but I do have to be thorough. I do want to hit uh, some high points. So I do appreciate your patience. Um, here's what we saw. These videos, if you recall, that were taken by production outfitters, they were taken on October 13th of 2021. What these demonstrate to you is that Ms. Gutierrez was unwilling to maintain proper firearm safety repeatedly. And it's really important because this is not a case where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake and that one mistake was accidentally putting a live round into that gun. That's not what this case is about. This case is about constant, never-ending safety failures that resulted in the death of a human being and nearly killed another. So let's talk about all of the safety failures that we saw and the reason that these safety failures prior to October 21st are so critically important to the analysis is because they go to foreseeability. And foreseeability is a very important element in this case. So as we can see here, we have our um, stunt man with his double barrel shotgun. From watching those videos, what you understood is that Ms. Gutierrez did appear to, in fact, be present because at times we saw her and at times we heard her. So she wasn't off doing prop duties. She was right there and she never intervened. 
Gun pointed at a child. Gun pointed at Joel Souza directly at his back. Gun pointed up in the air in the direction of the stunt coordinator. Gun pointed again, apparently in the direction of Mr. Souza, the person on the far right. Gun pointed directly at Mr. Souza again, the firearm in the left hand of the stuntman who is facing you. Firearm pointed directly at a minor child. Firearm pointed directly at the camera. Ms. Gutierrez holding that same firearm with the muzzle pointed at her own face. <laughs> Oof. Man. That one hurt. Yeah. That one's a bad one. Um, <coughs> this was. How about the one where he hands it off to unexpected. the kid? There it is. Miss Gutierrez right. stood by and did nothing in between scenes when that stuntman, who had certainly been sent the message that he could do whatever he wanted with those guns, no one was going to intervene. The person tasked with intervening was not going to do it. That was clear. He hands the firearm to the child and allows the child to manipulate the gun before then, after a short period of time, perhaps thinking better of it and taking the gun back. Jesus. This firearm, I actually don't think in this photo that the firearm is pointed at the child. I think the firearm is, based on the angle of the camera, probably more pointed at this person right here. Um, but she's there. We hear her. We see her. She does nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is some of the first evidence that we see where... If something doesn't stop, if something doesn't change, she is moving in, in the direction of potentially a fatal incident, and that is exactly what happened. And I want you to recall Ms. Gutierrez's interview on November 9th when Ms. Gutierrez uh, spoke of the accidental discharge with the other stuntman. Um, having a complete lack of understanding of her role in safety on this movie set, she's talking about Sarah Zachary, and she was like, well, yours just went off in there after you loaded it. And I said, yeah, well, I can't be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun and doesn't understand the concept that it's hot. Wow. Her entire job Oof. is to be responsible for, for every, exactly that. For every fucking dickhead stuntman. And when stunt she man. took this job, she agreed to that responsibility. There is no exception in the law for your young. The exception in the law does not exist. The law treats everyone the same, and it must. What was the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle? Well, here's the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle. More negligence, more carelessness, more lack of attention to safety. She loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds that, by the way, according to the director, was completely unnecessary. Because, yes, while it's true, this gun operates in a way where if a certain type of camera angle is hitting it, dummy rounds would be appropriate if the scene calls for loading or cycling. 
There wasn't a scene that called for that. So she just loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds and surprisingly put the wrong caliber round in the gun. That is absolutely an example of someone who is not paying attention, not taking their job seriously. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the rounds that you've seen because it's critical to tracking the existence of the live rounds on this movie set. And we have spent a lot of time and effort tracking those rounds around that movie set. We're going to show you that evidence right now. So the important thing to know is that the Seth Kenny dummies, which you are looking at right here, are patinaed. They are distinct. They have an antique coloring. They also have silver primers. These rounds did not come on that movie set until October 12th of 2021 because Mr. Kenny didn't have them and if you recall his testimony he was in Texas. So he had to get back, clean them up, and provide them to Sarah Zachary, and that took place on October 12th. This is just simply the primer side of those rounds. You can see that they're dark in color on the primer side, and they do appear to have silver primers. This is a photograph of the 3840 dummies. If you recall Mr. Kinney's testimony, the 3840 dummies came from Billy Ray. And the important thing about this photograph is that none of those dummy rounds had silver primers. And silver primer is a very important piece of this puzzle. This is those same rounds on their side. You can see that they are shiny brass. We also know that they have brass primers. We just saw that. Uh, based on Mr. Kenny's testimony, you know that they were 3840, but there was also some 4440 caliber rounds um, in that box. Does that matter they're not working? Well, let's stop. Okay. Um, let's take a moment to talk about all this testimony that you've heard about whether or not the live rounds found at PDQ, which are photographed there on the left, match the live rounds found on the set of Rust. You don't have to be a gun expert to look at those and see they simply do not match. Even though you could look at those rounds and fundamentally understand that they are not the same, the police department, I'm sorry, sorry, the sheriff's department sent them to the FBI for testing so that we could actually have some experts confirm what we can see with our very own eyes. And what you have in evidence, if you want to see them in, in real time, you have States Exhibit 79, you have States Exhibit 91. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from PDQ Props. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from the set of rust. You can look at them, you can see the projectiles are different, you can see that uh, it, perhaps the primers are even, are, are even different. If you recall, uh, Ms. Popple indicated there were only 10 silver primered live rounds found at PDQ, the rest of them were brass. The other thing that you can just see with your eyes is the gunpowder in these is substantially different. It has a different chemical composition. So any argument that could ever be made in this case that Seth Kinney 
was the source of these live rounds is absolutely dishonest. Now, I'm going to ask you to take a, take a walk in the weeds with me here, okay? This is a photograph of October 10th of 2021. You can see the color of the rounds at the top. Those are brass primered rounds. The rounds in the bottom appear to be lighter and I would suggest to you based on the totality of the evidence that we're going to go through that you are looking at live rounds. And keep in mind anything that you see on the set of this movie that is a revolver ammunition that is revolver ammunition prior to October 12th if it has a silver primer, it's a live round. Because the silver primered dummies didn't come on set for two days after this photograph was taken. Here's our comparison photo that Mr. Primo put together for us. And if you need it, when you're reviewing the evidence and doing your deliberations or engaging in your deliberations, I have included it for you. Um, but by the way, just real quick, because Bob didn't see this, they paid a man ten thousand dollars to make the photo on the left supposedly clearer on the right. Bob, just an FYI. Wow. We're going to do a comparison here in a moment. Fail. Now, Fail. the importance of this photograph still October tenth of twenty twenty one. There, are, there appears to be revolver ammunition in the background there at the top. Two of those have silver primers. The problem with that is the silver primer dummies weren't there yet. But the live rounds were. And there's your close-up. It's absolutely undeniable. Is it blurry? Yes. Can you clearly see the difference? Absolutely. All of these photos that you're looking at were October 10th. Now, let's move to October 13th of 2021. I invite you to look at that photograph carefully and ask yourselves, which of these is not like the others? It's the third one from the left. It's a little stubbier. Look at the shape of that projectile and look at the color of the brass. So on October 13th, Mr. Kenny's dummies have arrived on set. They are the only dummy rounds with silver primers, but they are patinaed in color. So when you look at this round, it appears to be a spot-on match for the live rounds, but unfortunately we can't see the primer in this photo, so we can't tell if this is a brass primered dummy. That's the reason that we watched thousands of videos and looked at thousands of pictures because then we move to the production outfitter videos from October 13th, the same day. And we're looking at that same gun holster that was provided to Mr. Baldwin. And there you see it. The third one down has a silver primer. And now you know it is a live round. You know that because it's not a Seth Kinney dummy. If it were, it wouldn't have that shiny brass color. So there's your live round. We've seen it on nice. October 10th. We've seen it on October 13th. And there's absolutely no way that the lighting is playing tricks on our eyes when we're looking at these enhanced photos because you see it frame 
after frame, after frame. And now let's move to October 15th. Karen Kuhn arrives on set. I think she was probably there long before the 15th. She is taking photos. She took approximately, as she testified, 9,000 photos. So on the 15th, there it is. There's your silver primer. It's just been moved to a different location in the holster because they're pulling dummy rounds from here, there, and everywhere and putting them in belts and putting them in guns and do, you know doing whatever they want to do. But there it is. It's right there on October 15th. And if you think I'm stretching it, Let's have a look at what we've got here. This is the gun belt that was assigned to actor Jensen Ackles. Because his gun belt was not a shoulder holster, we weren't able to find any photos or videos of it in the thousands and thousands and thousands that we reviewed because they're always covered by his coat. There is the evidence photo of the Baldwin holster on October 21st when it is taken into evidence. You have a Seth Kinney dummy at the top. You have what the FBI determined to be a live round in the second spot. And then you've got three brass primered dummies. October 17th, October 21st. So the video that Mamie Mitchell laid the foundation for. She said, she said that according to her notes, the filming was done on the 17th. Mr. Primo said that he believed according to the camera, it was the 18th. Take whatever date, whatever date you want. That's a match. Seth Kenny dummy at the top, live round next. You've got three brass primer dummies on the 21st, four brass primer dummies on the 17th or 18th. But it is shockingly the same. And there is no question that this one right here is a live round. It was sent to the FBI and they confirmed it. Spot on, Jade. This is Ms. Gutierrez talking about um, her bringing these dummy rounds on set. I had a multitude of the ones with holes and the ones that you shake, so yeah. And I checked those all and I put them into two things. And then we start talking about boxes. Obviously when she says things, she's talking about boxes. They usually had JS on them. This is one my dad sent me, and mine are usually beat up pretty bad, like they're very dirty and gross. She's talking about the box and the styrofoam insert. The box and the styrofoam insert, she's saying, are dirty. Hers, the ones that she brings on set, are dirty. They're not new and clean like some of the other ones. Detective Hancock asks her, this is the one that was or handed that you guys had said that you had pulled from. This is that moment in that interview where Ms. Gutierrez has already shown Hancock the photo from her dad and an hour or two later, Detective Hancock decides that now is the time to show her the photo of the box of dummies she was pulling from that day, and it won't surprise you to learn they're a spot on match. You have the styrofoam insert from that box of dummies here in evidence, and the reason that we gave it to you so that you can actually look at it 
in real time and not look at a photograph is because it's kind of dirty and gross. It kind of fits exactly the way that she described it. But there are some characteristics of this styrofoam insert that are going to become more important. Any, any suggestion by the defense that somehow the box of dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez said she was pulling from was swapped out with something different uh, is absolute nonsense. First of all, you know that because you can see the live rounds. If you don't think you can see them on the 10th, and you don't think you can see them on the 13th, and you don't think you can see them on the 15th, you know you're looking at one on the 17th and 18th. You know you are. So where's, where does the sabotage theory go then? The 17th and 18th, the camera crew hadn't quit yet. Mr. Norvell wasn't on set poking around on the, uh, on the prop cart. Mr. Halls hadn't had an opportunity to, to spend any time with the gun. They moved directly from that cart right into Lieutenant Benavides's patrol unit. They go from that patrol unit right into evidence at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And on November 9th of 2021, Hannah Gutierrez shows Detective Hancock, now Corporal Hancock, the box of dummies that she and her dad have. And if you listen to Mr. Kenny's testimony, what you understand is that the ammunition from the previous set, that being the old way, Hannah brought leftover dummies from that movie onto the set of Rust, and those 45 long colt dummy rounds were provided by Thel Reed. Now we know why he wasn't called as a witness. Yeah. <laughs> what you are looking at in this photo is this styrofoam insert. This is the styrofoam insert that had the live round in it. This is the styrofoam insert that came out of the box labeled 45 long colt dummies with the JS in the middle. Now, let's put it together. Our original evidence photo up here from October 10th, you can see this distinct uh, sort of cut in the styrofoam on that insert that is sitting on her leg on the 10th. You can see that the hole in the styrofoam in the second to the right at the top is dirty. You can see a little bit of grime you can see it right there, and you're going to take it into evidence, and you can look at it closer. You're going to see that there's some damage to the styrofoam separators between these two holes. And what do you know? It's right there. There's a little bit of damage to the styrofoam separators down here. You can see it in the photo on the right. You can look for yourself. It is right here. And what do you know? That silver primered round from October 10th is sitting in the exact same position that it was found on October 21st when the Sheriff's Department collected this box, took it into evidence, and photographed it. Ladies and gentlemen, we call that circumstantial evidence, but that's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. Prop assistant duties versus armor duties on October 21st of 2021. Let's focus on that day. And listen, I'm not here to tell you that Rust Productions did the right thing when they hired on a part-time armorer and asked her to 
to also spend her time doing props. I think everybody who has testified has said that was a really bad idea, and that's probably part of the reason that they're being sued by a whole bunch of different people. But on October 21st, this was simply not the case. It was not the case on that day. She had three hours in the morning waiting for the camera crew to arrive. She had every opportunity to go through that box of dummies, gee, that only had like 30 rounds in it. How long does it take to pull the round out of the box, shake it, and if it doesn't shake, look to see if it has a hole in it, put it back in the box, and do that to each and every one of them. How long does that exercise take? 10 minutes max? That's not hard. The other thing that is very important is Ms. Gutierrez didn't get pulled out of the church because she had to go focus on prop duties. She left the gun in the church contrary to all the industry standards uh, for armors on movie sets, for firearm safety on movie sets, and she went back out to her cart so that she could start doing other armor duties. She's getting her fanny pack filled up. Well, we've seen that. She's filling it with blanks. And we know they're about to do a turnaround. They're going to do this, this, uh, quick, this quick insert with Baldwin, and then they're going to do the shoot scene, the, the, the gunfire scene where they're using blanks, and the law enforcement have come into the church, and there's a shootout. So she goes to get ready for it. She just leaves the gun in there. As you heard from many witnesses, she would leave guns unattended all the time. There was nothing unusual about October 21st that caused her to be unable to stay in the church to properly perform her duties. She leaves the gun. She goes back out because for some reason, with the three hours of, uh, of free time that she had in the morning, she didn't get her fanny pack filled up. She didn't get herself ready for that turnaround. So she leaves the gun. Everybody's heard, armors don't leave the gun. Now, let's move over to our tampering with evidence charge. How is getting rid of a bag of cocaine tampering with evidence related to involuntary manslaughter. Well, on October 21st, 2021, the shooting occurs, the incident occurs. Um, Ms. Gutierrez understands that someone has been seriously injured. She does not yet know that that person is not going to live or has already died. She gets interviewed at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. I will say, surprisingly, two occasions after this incident where a helicopter had to come in, ambulances had to come in, um, Ms. Gutierrez, on two occasions after that incident, spoke about her concerns about her career. Wow. That gives you an idea that you are dealing with someone who is not particularly concerned about the health and safety of others. And her wow. job was to be concerned about the health and safety of others. But on that day, she's just thinking about herself. She's put a lady in the hospital, a man in the hospital, she asks to be escorted to the bathroom. Corporal Hancock agrees to do that, and we have her on video on the way there expressing dismay about how this will affect her career. Man. Ouch. Ouch. After the interview, Hannah goes back to her hotel. <clears throat> Rebecca Smith goes to Hannah's room. She's been summoned by some other folks to try to sort of sit and visit and give Hannah some support. So Rebecca Smith goes to her room and Rebecca Smith is the person that tells Hannah that Helena Hutchins has now died. And you have to understand, 
in the mind of Hannah Gutierrez, this investigation went from this big to this big. Because the difference between shooting someone and them living and shooting someone and them dying is a really, really big difference. So she is told by Rebecca Smith, investigation just got giant and very, very serious. So after receiving that information, she offloads this bag of cocaine to Rebecca Smith. Rebecca Smith is a lady that's lived a life. She's used cocaine before, many years previous, but she's used cocaine. She knows what it looks like. She knows how it's packaged. And because she's a former addict, she tosses it in a trash can. When Mr. Bowles gets up here and says, I can't prove to you that it's cocaine, remember that when people destroy evidence to avoid prosecution, you don't have the evidence that they destroyed, they got rid of it. So I don't have to prove to you by some scientific uh, 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 drug test, I don't have to send that to the lab and get it tested. It's gone. That's the point to the charge. <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> now, let me let me digress a little bit and and run through a couple of things with you. What's all this testimony about this inertia puller? And how does that play into everything? Well, as you heard from Mr. Haig, an inertia puller is a device designed for one task. It disassembles live rounds. That's what it does. Somehow I think the defense got confused about what our potential theory was that we had a theory that Ms. Gutierrez was turning dummy rounds into live rounds. That was never our theory, because that would require quite a bit of equipment. There's no question. But to do the reverse is a whole lot easier. So if you're out of dummy rounds or you're running low on dummy rounds and you've got some live rounds around, you could probably turn a dummy round, I'm sorry, you could turn a live round into a dummy round in five minutes. Why does an armor on a movie set bill for an inertia puller? Well, obviously she had one. Now, let's talk about the OSHA investigation. OSHA doesn't find any wrongdoing with individual employees, only employers. That's their job. They're just an agency that maintains workplace safety. Mr. Genoway confirmed when he was on the witness stand, it's true his memory was a little bad and Mr. Lewis had to refresh it for him, but he confirmed that Hannah's conduct on the set contributed to their findings that this was not a safe workplace. Please keep in mind that the OSHA investigation is not a criminal investigation. Critically and surprisingly, OSHA never interviewed Gabrielle Pickle. This is critically important because if, if they had interviewed her, they would have known the following things. Anna was granted 10 armor days out of the 12 filming days, not eight. That was right there in the cell phone records. The training days when Ms. Gutierrez is, is sending those messages saying, I want more training time, training days. She's not saying these actors, these adults need more training time. She specifically requested additional training time to train the child. And it was refused because first of all, it's a major liability issue. And second of all, the child was never going to fire a gun. So when she asked for the additional training days, they were denied. That's not the reason Helena Hutchins is dead.
keep in mind, Gabrielle Pickle uh, had a meeting with Hannah and offered her additional assistance so that she would be able to perform her duties effectively. She offered assistance uh, from some of the other folks there on set to try to give her some relief. And keep in mind that on a movie set, the armorer has autonomy with regard to gun safety. The, the, the OSHA finding that Rust Productions failed to properly supervise her is surprisingly incorrect because the armor no. has no supervisor when it comes to weapons and gun safety on the movie set. Go ahead, Lisa, that's incorrect. Yes, they do. They have a first AD, they have a director, they have a second AD, they have a UPM, all DGA members, and Pickles, who herself said, it's my set. Absolutely 100% incorrect. 100% we'll across the we'll board. We'll see if the uh, defense brings up that in their closing, I, I bet. Mr. Holmes is just there to be a second pair of eyes. That's it. No. 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 Now, I think there can be no question that Rust Productions was more than negligent when they hired Ms. Gutierrez because she was not anywhere close to being qualified for this job. In fact, if you recall, Gabrielle Pickle, to her credit, tried to get Ms. Gutierrez to implement a check-in and check-out system because two people had complained that there was a shotgun left unattended. People on the set were complaining about her. They went to production and said, hey, she's not supposed to do that. You can't just leave real guns laying around. So Gabrielle That's Pickle goes to Hannah I Gutierrez, asks for a check-in. What's that? And that's when she should have been fired. That is production's responsibility to take every threat seriously. You come out, you investigate it, you take that person out of the mix and everybody else out of the endangerment because of one person. That's Pickles, that's Roe, that's every DGA member. And that's probably Alec, and that's probably why he has a trial, right? I mean, that they gotta, they're going up to someone else. I mean, well, I guess we'll Check out system, Hannah Good uh, Gutierrez says no. Hannah Gutierrez says it's too difficult, it's too much trouble. Gabrielle Pickle didn't prevent her from being safe. In that instance, she did the opposite. She tried to improve firearm safety on the set, but keep in mind, the armor has autonomy. So Gabrielle Pickle is not Hannah Gutierrez's boss when it comes to firearm safety. Ms. Gutierrez gets to do what she wants. Now I can only Are you imagine right now? that after- Are you kidding me right now? Of course she has autonomy over an armor. She hired that person. She is in charge of safety as much as everybody else. She has complete autonomy of her. Come on. Pickles this chain of case- Sorry, go ahead. What? No, go ahead. I said Pickles is suddenly the hero here who like did everything right and you know it's all go on. We'll see. We'll see what the defense is. All of that will change. So the defense has taken a shotgun approach to this case. Seth Kinney is to blame. Well, no evidence of that. Sarah Zachary is to blame. No evidence of that. Dave Halls is to blame. He shouldn't have taken the gun from her, um, and he didn't do a good safety check. Well, she is the autonomous decision maker with regard to gun safety. It's not that Dave Halls shouldn't have taken the gun from her, it's that she shouldn't have given him the gun and then turned around and walked away. Uh, the defense. Alec Baldwin is to blame for acting like a prima donna on the movie set and bossing people around. This is Hollywood, for heaven's sakes. 
I would imagine that's relatively common. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that his conduct was right. I am the person who indicted him. Oof. Alec Baldwin's conduct and his lack of gun safety inside that church on that day is something that he's going to have to answer for. Not with you and not today. That'll be with another jury on another day. Brian Norvell, the gentleman who goes and gets the prop cart and wheels it over and then puts his hand over the crime scene tape and picks up that dummy round and shakes it. You heard Mr. Bowles ask some questions that, 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 that are intended to make people think that uh, Mr. Norvell either took something off the prop cart or planted something on the prop cart. Well, keep in mind... <coughs> He doesn't have to plant live rounds because we've seen from the photographic evidence, those are there, they're floating around already. Um, so live rounds were on set, they were not planted by, by Brian Norvell. But this man is not a mystery to the state or the defense. I made him come in and sit down for a one and a half hour interview so that the defense could ask him any questions they wanted and they asked him none. Not a single question. So what that means is that this is just all smoke and mirrors and deflection. They don't want the truth. We know the truth. You have seen it throughout this trial. And I will remind you that during one of the heated objection exchanges between myself and Mr. Bowles, you heard Mr. Bowles cry out that he was looking for the truth. Listen, I can bring a horse to water, but I cannot make him drink. If you want the truth, I'll bring the guy in. I'll make him available for you to talk to. Ask him some questions. Not a single one. It must have been that disgruntled camera crew. You mean the people who believed that safety on set was being compromised to such a degree that they left? That decision may very well have saved their lives. So the $60,000 question in this case, who brought the live rounds on set? You know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. She brought them on set, and you know from the testimony you heard, Sarah Zachary never saw her shake a dummy round. Dave Halls never saw her shake a dummy round. She didn't shake those dummy rounds. For all we know, those dummy rounds were floating around the set of the old way, and Nicolas Cage is lucky to have walked away with his life. <coughs> so why does it matter that she brought live rounds on set? It goes to foreseeability. She had six, six, Live rounds on that movie set. The earliest date that I can track them for you is October 10th. We know that they were there from the 10th to the 21st. Six, and she failed to ferret them out for 12 days. What that means is that she wasn't shaking any dummy rounds. She wasn't testing anything. None of that stuff that her lawyers want you to think was so difficult. It was no, none of it was happening. It didn't happen the entire time. She didn't find any of them. And folks, if she's not checking the dummy ammunition during the pendency of the filming, to make sure that those rounds that are designed to look like live rounds are in fact dummy rounds. This was a game of Russian roulette. 
every time an actor had a gun with dummies. Sadly for Ms. Hutchins, her camera crew walked off set that morning and that required her to go into the church and operate the camera herself. And that's what she was doing when the live round that Ms. Gutierrez put in Mr. Baldwin's gun was expelled from that firearm and went all the way through her body. No one told Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church. No one called her out of the church. There wasn't a COVID protocol in place that prevented her from being in the church at that moment. You know from the production outfitter videos, she didn't care about her job. She let it all go. Mr. Bowles is going to argue to you that if, if Mr. Halls had just called Ms. Gutierrez back into the church, she would have done an additional safety check and that live round would have been found, well, for heaven's sakes. We all know that if she had been called back into the church for an additional safety check, nothing would have changed. Nope. Her safety checks didn't consist of pulling the dummy rounds out of the cylinder, shaking them in front of the actor and the assistant director, showing them that they're dummy rounds, and putting them back in. No one ever saw her do that one single time, even though that's industry standard. And the reason it's industry standard is because you can't tell a dummy round by simply spinning a cylinder and looking at the primers unless they are dummy rounds without primers. And that's kind of an interesting fact. We know that six dummy rounds without primers were not loaded into that weapon because one of them turned out to be live and very clearly had a primer. Interestingly though, she had five dummy rounds without primers in her pocket. In her pocket. All she had to do was put those in the gun make sure that the sixth one either rattles or has a hole in it and she's good to go because now when you look when the cylinder gets spun you can see five of them without taking them out that they don't have primers they were in her pocket and she didn't use them um, I am going to have another opportunity to speak with you, and when I speak with you uh, last, it won't be as long, I promise, um, and we will talk about some of our jury instructions then, but I do want to address some of the testimony from, the, from Dr. Gerald from OMI, uh, because Mr. Bowles is likely to make an argument that there was some sort of medical negligence uh, that contributed to Ms. Hul to, to Ms. Hutchins' death and I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Gerald's testimony. Here are the lethal injuries, the lethal injuries, blood loss from, from the wound. That was the primary lethal in injury. Her blood was leaking into her, in, into her abdominal cavity and a lot of it. And you saw those photographs, you saw the photographs of her clothing. There was a lot of blood. So the first lethal injury that comes from the gunshot it is blood loss associated with it. And the second one, if you recall from Dr. Gerald, uh, the, the wound to the, to the lung was also a lethal wound. Keep in mind, that bullet went into her body, it went through her rib, it severed her spinal cord, it punctured her lung, it came out the back of her shoulder, and a few hours later, Ms. Gutierrez 
is telling Corporal Hancock that she's worried about her career. If you think that person would have done a satisfactory safety check if she had been called back to the church, I am here to tell you that I strongly disagree. The astonishing lack of diligence with regard to gun safety is without question a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. Did Mr. Baldwin also contribute when he pointed the gun at people and pulled the hammer back and regardless of what he said to George Stephanopoulos, pulled the trigger? Ooh. Yes, he is. And again, we'll deal with that another time. You don't escape accountability when you load a live round into a prop gun, tell the crew that it has dummy rounds in it, hand it off to an actor and leave the room because he manipulated it? That's the whole point. That was the whole point to him having it. Of course he was going to manipulate it. It's foreseeable. Everything is so completely foreseeable. Imagine I hand you a gun and I tell you that it's basically empty and I walk away when in fact I put live ammunition in it. You think an accident might happen? You think that accident is foreseeable? And listen, let's remember some of the testimony from Mr. Carpenter. Control is how we enforce gun safety. We do it with control. When she loses control, which she did repeatedly, anything goes. Anything goes there. I am going to complete the majority of the portion of my closing arguments with regard to the facts. The next portion will be with regard to the law. When I come back after Mr. Bowles has had an opportunity to address you, uh, we will be asking for justice today for Helena Hutchins. Thank you. Now, can we approach? Well, if it's about a bathroom <clears throat> break, we're going to take a bathroom break. Okay. Okay. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received. Okay? All right. Hey, everybody. All right. So we're behind. So that's In the that's whole good. country. And if you're All right. They're not back. Let's get into this. We have... Hey, okay. Bob. I have a major question for you. Yep. If... If... So there was testimony that the EMTs intubated her through her esophagus twice. If... She, if they had intubated her properly, and should she have survived, we'd be looking at a lesser charge, right? Well, yeah. If they, I mean, if she lived, if she survived, I mean, we wouldn't be looking at any kind of homicide charge at all. Right. So, do the and the jury don't have any other charges to look at. Can they find her not guilty just based on that? Theoretically, yes. I mean, I, I would be surprised if the defense doesn't argue it, you know, that the that the EMT's actions were an intervening cause of her death, you know? I mean, it, like, that that doesn't allow them to prove each and every element of the crime. So I, I'm anticipating, I, I think that they'll focus on that, uh, and they're also going to focus on what, what she was talking about, the you know, the shotgun approach, ba basically blaming everybody else. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, and, and everybody needs to understand like this, it's a homicide case. It's not a murder case. There, there you know, there's not intent. Like I, I see people comparing her to like Katie Mag Magbanaba or whatever the fuck her name is. Like, this is not that like th this was a, a horrible accident that took place. Um, you know, there was no intent. Uh, at least that's been shown 
by anybody uh, that that somebody was purposefully killed in this. So it's a different type of justice for Helena, no question. Um, I mean, theoretically, if she's found guilty, she can get probation. She may not even go to jail. Um, people just need to understand that this is this is a different type of case than your typical murder case. It, it, this isn't that. So, um, you know, and, and they're going to have to, to me, based on, and I'll be curious to see what the defense does, but based on what I saw and heard in that closing, I mean, she's on the hook, you know? I mean, I think, I think that they were able to establish that it was foreseeable um, and, and the causation side of it. You know, I think those two things are key. Uh, it was clearly foreseeable. Um, and as Lisa was saying, you know, there, there are other people and, the, and they're going to hammer that on the defense closing that there were other people that, that absolutely should have yanked her from the set, you know, at, at any point in time, you know, cause the set sounds like it was a fucking nightmare. Like the, not just the day that Helena was killed, but for, for weeks that this thing was a free for all there, you know, every single day is a shit show. Yeah, you yeah. know, so I, I, but at the end of the day, I, I think ultimately it's going to lay on her head. Um, you, you know, I mean, is there, you know, and, and I know I asked and I, and I think that somebody answered that there was a civil suit in this and was it, a bunch uh, of civil suits. and are the they way, still yeah, they pending? Yeah, they haven't gone to trial yet. Yeah, they're yeah, still yeah. pending. They haven't gone to trial. Okay. Before we yeah. go any, any further, I just want to say, please, guys, we're sharing the links. If you're new to the channel, you might not know Bob. Follow Defense Diaries, the podcast, the YouTube. Follow Karen's podcast. Check out Lisa's book. We're sharing all the links. So I'm really curious. You know, Karen, I want to get your thoughts on your, your kind of chopping. What, what did you yeah. think of that closing? What, what are you thinking of how it's gone so oh, far? Brilliant closing. Uh, just to piggyback on, on Bob and Lise, I think, you know, this is not a case of malintent. It's a case of negligence. That's why it's called negligent manslaughter right and i think and bob this is i would make it akin to failure to act like a failure to act in a case a failure of maybe a police officer failing to act to prevent a crime or failing to act to prevent harm to an individual that's how i'm kind of seeing seeing in this case yeah and um, i agree completely karen and, and that's why i thought the very first thing that she put up on screen was you know omission equals negligence yeah. <laughs> you know i mean exactly. and that was a very important point for the jury to see like it's it's huge for them to see that not doing something that you should have done is just as damning as doing something that you should have done you know they're the exact equivalent in the eyes of the law i'll you know, tell you what been watching... bullets... sorry again oh, seeing ahead. all those bullets on set every day in their bandoliers it was, that was probably the most horrifying thing that I saw. And everybody is right. There's a couple uh, comments in, in the uh, chat. It was literally playing Russian roulette every single day. Imagine if that kid had been there. And, you know, it, it is such a horrifying thing when I saw that. That was so fucking horrible to see and to know that this was just a disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, well, I, I thought, think uh, well, Jade, Jade pointed that out in the in the chat. I was kind of watching the scroll and Jade said, this was a game of Russian roulette every single day. And I popped in and said, you were absolutely 100% correct. The fact that they got away with it for as long as they did, knowing what was going on on that set, what, what is, is, is a miracle. It's yeah. a miracle. Um, yeah. I also want to say, We've all been watching this with Jay for over a week now, and it got really convoluted in between with the, the patina and the rounds and the primers and the what. And she just did the most brilliant job of laying that all out in a timeline of who had what when, what was on the set, what containers they were in, how you can follow along when Seth Kenny's crap got on set versus what Hannah had beforehand. It cleared up everything in my head and this is why timelines are so critical in a case especially when you're dealing even with circumstantial evidence that laid it out so clearly to me i was sitting here actually kind of stunned because i went that's the point they were trying to get to because i kept all, all week going what in the hell 
are they talking about with this patina crap? It was driving me crazy. Now I get it. She plus just we're looking it. at yeah. Plus we're looking at blurry photos, going, "What is she saying?" She wasn't driving that part yeah. home at all. But when she, like Karen said, when she pulled it together during closing, I, that's when it really hit me. Oh my God, oh, these bullets were no. a minimum of 10 days before the incident, a minimum. And we don't know, yeah. even know how far they're back it goes. And Bob, a lot of times on. it's it's tough for sorry Jay it's it's tough for you know when she's going through and putting the the witnesses on they may not be able to wrap it up in a way that that makes it clear to the jury that's the entire point of closing arguments where she's able to say you know because like a lot of times you'll have a trial where things seem disjointed during the trial because you're really having to put your your evidence on through witnesses who many times, even if you've prepped them, you know, like ad nauseum, they still may get it up there and drop the ball a little bit in terms of making it as clear as you want to make it. That's why closings are so huge. And she did. She did a great job. You know, for me, who had missed like a bulk of, of the trial because I was on a cruise, just partying, listening to music, you know, having a great time, um, you know, but she she really she did a great job for me. In, in understanding what evidence they put on and, and why it mattered. Oh, and to your point, Bob, just real quick, I just want, uh, I'll go to Karen. To Bob's point, he just talked about right before we got on, you didn't, she didn't read. She knew her fucking case and she presented it in a matter where she wasn't, she was presenting in a matter that was like, wow, it, it broke it all down. Like you said, Karen, go ahead. But like, Bob, you were just talking about that. You never read and we've seen people read them and it's garbage because it's like, they're just reading. You're not, she hit, I felt like she hit the emotions. Thought she did awesome. Go ahead, Karen. I'm sorry. Really good. Just two quick forensic points that I want to make because they were so important for this closing. One, when she brought the styrofoam container out with the photograph to timeline that and showed, we would call it kind of akin to fracture matching. In other words, here's the dents and the dings and the, and the dirt and the stuff on, it's right here in this baggie for you to look at. And here's the photo with the live round sitting in it. You can match those two things. That is equating to, like, if I go to a hit-and-run traffic accident and I find a piece of a uh, turn signal on the, on the pavement and I collect it, then we find a car that, you know, is missing part of its turn signal and I can literally go in and fracture match that too. That, that is irrefutable circumstantial evidence right there, which is exactly what she just did. It was brilliant. Second, Afi, when she was on with me last week, she said, if I was the prosecutor on that case, I'd bring out a stopwatch and go, how difficult is it to shake the rounds and put them in the gun? How much time did that take? She nailed it. She said, how much time does that take? And she erred on the side of caution and said, what, 10 minutes? Alfie was like, what, a minute? Yeah. Either way, three hours, and she didn't bother. It, it was just a brilliant point. I really liked that close. I thought it was great, too. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a very effective closing. Uh, we have a question from Legal Mob and Jen, and I gotta find it. She was asking uh, a question for Bob. I don't know if you know Bob. I missed the jury instructions. Can Hannah be found on a guilty on a lesser included charge? Uh, no, no. Okay. No. Well, she can't be found guilty of both. Okay. It's it's double the the Fifth Amendment double jeopardy doesn't allow for that to happen. It's 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 one or the other. So. Um, but correct. Bob, wait, go. I you Evan broke up, Karen. But evidence tampering is a separate charge, correct? Hunter, absolutely. It's, it's an entirely different count. So, yeah, she's... She what, what's interesting about... Count? Yes, she can be found on the lesser included, but like if they find her guilty on the involuntary manslaughter, they they can't find her guilty on the, the lesser included of the negligent use of a deadly weapon. But the uh, it, it, what's interesting to me about the the tampering with the, the evidence is that I don't know if they created the nexus that the cocaine was really kind of a germane piece of evidence in proving the involuntary manslaughter. You know what I mean? It, like, I, I don't know. Like, she clearly tampered with evidence. There's no question about it. But in in relation to the to the charge of involuntary manslaughter, which is what they're arguing. They're arguing, they, they weren't arguing that she disposed of evidence so that they couldn't charge her with possession of a controlled substance. They're arguing that she disposed of evidence so that they couldn't prove the involuntary manslaughter. 
I, I'm going to, I'm curious to see how the defense is going to handle that. I mean, I would certainly be arguing that, uh, you know, if I, if in my closing, if I was handling the defense side of it, um, and it's kind of an interesting question. I didn't see a lot of the trial though, you know, because that, the, the question comes like for me, I think that the, the weed smoking were, it definitely affects people's short-term memory and makes people, I, I, I don't know. Like to me, that's a more effective argument than, than the Coke argument. That's you interesting. Know, the Coke, or you know, if Coke they the- had said that the cocaine was on set. In other words, what somebody does after hours, assuming that they are sobered up and ready to go at four in the morning when their alarm goes off, is really nobody's business. If it affects them at the workplace or they're doing it at the workplace, like if they showed that they were doing rails in the bathroom and that's why she was going, that's a huge and whole different ballgame. But the only thing that that the hiding of the cocaine did for me is it shows that what steps she's willing to take to hide her actions. Great point. Yeah, great point. And Bob, if you missed, basically what yesterday, what happened is the food craft services person came. Her name was Becca. She came on the night of the night after, basically, she calls her in the hotel room and is like, hey, can you take this and gives her a bag of cocaine? You know, they can't prove it's cocaine, a bag that looks like cocaine. She is a recovering right. addict. She walks out, throws it away, doesn't really say anything to anyone. And that's why we're getting this charge. Um, yeah. De- but was was it a creatine? Yeah, the defense is like a <laughs> yeah, creatine right. or powdered sugar because you always have powdered sugar. You never know when you're going to have French toast. Keep some on you at, at all times. <laughs> Yeah, it's her. Yeah. It's her. Uh, you know, gluten-free almond flour. You know, I mean, but, I didn't, but it's interesting. Time. I didn't know that it has. Like, I thought it just just that act in and of itself was that's tampering. But you're saying it has to be related to the fact that she, you know, well, yeah, some- because she they for whatever they weren't able to charge her because the one thing that they could not do or would have mattered in terms of lab testing, at least to a certain extent. I mean, I've had clients get you know busted for trying to sell cocaine and it turned out that it was not blow that they were selling junk and they still got charged with the exact same crime but in terms of what the way that the the she stated it in her closing was that they're using that tampering of an evidence is that that was evidence that would have helped them in improving the inv- uh, involuntary manslaughter charges which is which is interesting. You know what I mean? I like, like she said it in the closing. I had never even thought of that as a concept. I just thought it was a standalone, you know, tampering with evidence, you know, destruction of evidence, spoilation of evidence type charge. And so like, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I'll, I'll see how it works out. Karen, I'm curious as, as someone who's testified in, in a ton of trials in something like this, yeah. do you think like someone, for example, like uh, Lucian Haig, is like watching right now like are you curious to the end you want to see what happens if you're called in as an expert like that no no, no okay. i don't i i i just uh wait for the call from the prosecutor at the end i literally well to be fair i had to go run calls i would go testify and then my right you know, i'd go and check my, my screen on my laptop and there'd be 15 calls holding so i had to go handle them. so it's not like i could sit in the courtroom um and i wouldn't have chosen to even if i could because it's too nerve wracking. It's just a, it's just not something that you follow. I think that once uh, he'll get a phone call from the prosecutor once the jury comes back with a verdict, and that'll be the end of it. That's my, I wouldn't think so. Now he's probably working on his next case. To be honest with you, if anybody's smart and they want a perfect armorer who knows what he's doing and wrote the book, his phone's ringing off the hook. At least I hope it is. Yeah, he was he was really amazing. And and so Lisa, I'm curious. <laughs> Uh, from your perspective, as far as people watching this trial, just in, in like you you know you're a director, you're, you're you're in the industry. Like, are people really watching this? Do they care, or like, what do you think yes, is going? Yes, people really oh. are watching it, and people want justice. You know, each time a tragedy like this occurs, sadly, it gets everybody riled up, and everybody wants to see that justice. They need to see the people who are responsible put to task. I will say that there are so many people out there who are frustrated that it's only Gutierrez and Baldwin who are being prosecuted because it's not going to make the change that they think it's going to make. The only thing that's going to make that change is when you get to these managerial people. 
when you get to the, the line producers, the UPM and the ADs. I can't tell you how many bad ADs there are out there. I was telling Karen this the other day. When I was an AD, every time I walked onto a new set, it would take me a week before the crew started actually listening to me and not giving me a side eye because so many of them are the Dave Hulls that just sit there looking at their watch, move, telling everybody, move faster, move faster, do this, do that, screaming right beneath their reactionaries as opposed to taking in what's happening around them and doing the best job they can. So yeah, there are so many people watching and so many people frustrated that this continues to be a thing, that we do something about it only after there's a tragedy. How many calls were there to this production company? It took somebody getting shot to shut this company down. Nobody was willing to do it until the tragedy happened. And what we people in the industry really want to happen is when I make a complaint because my safety is at risk, somebody actually take action before I'm shot. Uh, before you, I go to Bob, I want to I want to highlight. Sorry, go ahead, Karen. Uh, do you, you would just think that would be a no brainer, especially after Brandon Lee, Sarah on the train bridge. Yeah. And don't Violet forget John. it. You keep saying that, you know, Joel Souza is a victim and he's this and he's that. Don't forget in the Sarah Jones trial, the only person that went to prison was the director because a director does have a responsibility not to put his crew at risk. And he has equal responsibility to keep an eye out around him and make sure that the crew's safe. Uh, you know, years of working with, with Richard Donner, if he had seen this stuff happen, he himself would have shut this, this set down in a heartbeat and you don't have to be on a big budget movie for that to happen you just have to have decent people there are a lot of decent non-union hard-working people in new mexico and the carolinas and florida it just because it's low budget doesn't mean you have a bunch of buffoons working for you and you know that is the perfect storm of the rust set and i think that was one thing that i thought was a great thing that that uh, the prosecutor brought up in the closing there morrissey when she says, what is the first thing she's asking? Uh, what is the first thing Hannah's asking? My career. Like, she's really been like, like, think about this, people. Like, you think this is a person that gave a shit about the safety on the set? She's going to the bathroom. She doesn't want anyone to see her leave. She's asking if the copter in the sky is the news. She's asking about her next job. And I thought that was really, you know, a good And, point and what was the other comment she said? Oh, so I have to be the person that happened, that this happened since Brandon, uh, Brandon Lee. Right. That was her first comment out of the gate. Oh, so it had to be me that this happened to? It was like, I would have been sitting outside that church crying my fucking eyes out if I had been responsible for somebody else's injuries, let alone death. Uh, and before I go to Bob, Bob's talking. <laughs> um, Shannon Crime Spy says, what a luxury we've had having Karen and Lisa joining us every day. To try. Absolutely. I feel so grateful that you guys have been in the chat, uh, you know, educating us. Uh, so please, again, guys, please check them out and please help out with you know the book, the podcast. Um, we love you guys. It's been such a joy watching this with you because you know Karen and I were talking about it. When you're watching a trial at home, you and, and you don't have a situation like this, you're screaming at a TV or you're screaming at the walls, and nobody's there to like help you. It, it is literally therapy to be able to watch with a group of wonderful people and just bounce crap back and forth between them as opposed to a, a TV screen. And be snarky without being judged, man. Yeah. You know? Uh, absolutely. We, so thank you, guys. And thank you, Bob, for being... Bob, so Bob, I'm curious. You're the, you're, the, you're the defense attorney. You know that the prosecution, not only go they go first, they go again. So you got to kind of like, not only... Like, you have to prepare for what you've heard and what you think you're going to hear, right? Like, so I'm curious how you attack this. You know, you've done it so many times. How are you attacking this? Bob, you're muted. You muted yourself, Bob. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> is my do I look clear to you guys? Because you're like a little, me, you're a little blurry, but now you're a little bit better. You are blurry, but now you're better. Yeah, I don't know, dude. Um, all right, so yeah, typically with the rebuttal closing, um, I mean, and what they're really supposed to be doing in rebuttal is they're supposed to be rebutting what was said on. Uh, during the defense's closing. So when she kind of like showed her hand a bit there, saying that she was going to be going through the jury instruction, that's a little unusual. But yeah, you're trying to anticipate 
you know, what they're going to show on, or, or, you know, but it sounds like she's going to go through jury instructions on this. So he's going to, he's going to try to hit home his points and, uh, you know, just kind of take All right, you may be and rebuttal, but, um, it'll be interesting. Let's see what happens. Mr. Bowles. By the way, real quick, I'm just going to make this comment. I thought it was very interesting her saying, despite what Alex said uh, to George Stepanov, like going after Alec a little bit, I thought that was very interesting. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, police, court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I, I want to start also as I did when this began, which I want to sincerely thank you for your time and attention uh, and all of your work on this case. It's been hard. It's been a, a long case. And I, I want to thank you first. On behalf of Ms. Gutierrez Reed, who this is extremely important for her, this, this case, and this is her day in court. And it's extremely important that the government rule out every reasonable doubt that there is in this case, because that is our standard in this country. Reasonable doubt is a concept, meaning if you have any reasonable doubt, if you have a reasonable doubt, we cannot convict people in this country. That's how it's set up. Because of that, the burden is on the prosecution, always stays in the prosecution, and so they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubts. In this case, and I'm going to talk about a lot of the evidence soon, but I just want to start with a summary. The prosecutor just presented to you a series of pictures. Uh, and those were the pictures they paid the guy $10,000 to wow. enlarge. Uh, and they went through the pictures and they tried to show that there were silver primers and this is going to be definitive evidence that these live rounds had to be on set at a particular time. Let me tell you why there's reasonable doubt, number one, that they will never be able to rule out in this case. Sarah Zachary threw away rounds. She unquestionably threw away rounds after the shooting. That's undisputed. We have no idea what those look like. We will never have an idea what they look like, and that will never be able to be overcome. That one fact alone prevents that entire picture set up that was just shown to you from being accurate, from being real. Because we have no idea what those other round, whether they had silver primers, whether they were dummies, whether they were other types of, of dummies, what they look like, we have no idea. Fact two on the pictures. Seth Kenny told you he had gotten live rounds from Thel Reed that went to the 1883 set. Those live rounds were three types. There were three types of bullets. He then brought back around 125 of those of the three types. Now, the ones that the state seized, the prosecutors made a point of saying, these don't match the live rounds. However, we don't know what he had because they waited a month to go get him. It was over a month when they searched. And when Mr. Kenny brought in the rounds, he had been talking to the investigator about what was going on in the investigation. So we're never going to have an idea as to what Seth Kenny had and what he provided. Because he also told you in this trial, he had no inventory system. He had no idea what was coming in and going out of his place. The place was a wreck. It looked like a train had hit it. There's no way for somebody to, to really understand what they're putting in, what they're going out. And so he also said there were things that went onto the rust set that he hadn't inventoried, hadn't invoiced. He said that there were things that put on there that he didn't have invoiced. So here's the problem with that. We do not know that Seth Kenny only had those patinaed rounds. That's reasonable doubt. That's coming right from the government's witnesses, from Mr. Kenny. That part is unreconcilable. There is a reasonable doubt that will never leave this case on those two points, on the pictures and the live rounds. Now, Ms. Morrissey calls it dishonest, for us to raise a question about Mr. Kenny. And I submit it's not dishonest at all because they have the burden to investigate every possibility, uh, every aspect, 
as anybody in Miss Gutierrez Reed's place would deserve and would want because their life is on the line as well on felony charges and it's the government's duty to rule out all these other things. Far from dishonest, what it is is thoroughness, competence, finding what happened with Seth Kenny, taking his fingerprints, taking his DNA, going through and searching earlier, doing that investigation, and finding out if indeed there is another possibility that they ruled out right away and they never wanted to look into because they rushed to judgment on Miss Gutierrez Reed from the very beginning. They singled her out on that set. They put her in a cop car, whether she asked or whether they put her in. Uh, she's in the cop car and she never leaves custody until after her statement. They singled her out and they rushed to judge him on her and that's what you've seen ever since. Miss Morrissey says, and a camera crew, and she mocks things that we raise as possibilities on the idea that none of it can be possible except Miss Gutierrez Reed is guilty. That is the only thing that can be possible because I say it. It's not how it works. Miss Morrissey said she indicted Mr. Baldwin. I indicted Mr. Baldwin. Actually, I think it's the state of New Mexico. That's not an individual person with that power. She also sat there when Miss Zachary was on the stand, and Miss Zachary, I'll remind you, got an immunity agreement. Miss Zachary was promised she would never be prosecuted. And Miss Morrissey stands up and says, There's no evidence against Miss Zachary. Well, then why was she given an immunity agreement? Why would she need immunity if there's nothing against Miss Zachary? She's given an immunity agreement, and then she's told on redirect examination by Miss Morrissey. Remember, if you don't tell the truth, I can prosecute you. I will prosecute you. So Miss Zachary doesn't tell the version of the truth that the guy. Sorry, I got to pause this real quick. It is insane that this guy in the gallery is allowed to be there, nodding his head and reacting to the. How is that allowed? I. I government believes is true. We saw the threat in live court. You can't trust some of the witness testimony in this case, and that will raise a reasonable doubt as well, I submit, because of things like that. Because the lead investigator admits that she practiced her answers and questions with the prosecutor. That's something you can consider. Are you hearing everything? Or are you hearing a one-sided version that fits the narrative that Miss Gutierrez Reed has to be guilty because we picked her out first and it's got to be her? Can't be Mr. Kenny, can't be the, anything else, any other possibilities. Sarah Zachary has nothing to do with it. Even though we know unquestionably she threw away rounds after a uh, shooting. That's undoubtedly going to be evidence, but, but there's nothing on her, apparently. Second, these boxes. The idea that the boxes match. We heard testimony that these rounds were loaded in and out of these boxes daily. Nobody knows what was in them on the 13th, the 16th, the 21st, because the rounds were put in, they were taken out, and they were put in different boxes. So the boxes really are, don't matter. There's, there's reasonable doubt all over the place to the boxes, because we don't know what was in them three or four days before. It doesn't matter who brought them. Uh, the boxes are interesting because the government wants to match up the two, and they want to show the pictures that match, yet all the ones from PDQ Props have the same label, same font. They're from Joe Swanson. So those boxes are, are similar to the ones on set. So that, that part is, is not conclusive as well. The other part, when the government shows you video and video and video on, only on the 13th, and says Miss Gutierrez Reed was lax on safety. Well, again, you're seeing videos from short snippets of time on one day on an entire movie set, and then you're not seeing what Miss Gutierrez Reed may have done right after the clip. You're not seeing what might have happened right after that. The other thing that strongly rebuts all of the safety points Miss Morrissey is pointing out about Miss Gutierrez Reed is OSHA. 
Now they try to downplay OSHA, but OSHA is a separate, independent state and federal agency that did a full investigation into the responsibility for safety failures on this set. And you can evaluate the credibility in your minds of, of Mr. Montoya, who took the stand, and how you thought he testified, whether you thought he was thorough, and how he answered questions. He, he interviewed quite a few people, and he reviewed a lot of information. Their conclusion after that was done was that production was responsible. He said the root cause was production adopted a safety plan, and it ended at the word adoption because they didn't do anything after that. They didn't respond to complaints that there was- Sorry guys, I should have made it clear. This fucking guy is the guy I'm talking about. He's nodding, he's picking his nose, he's picking his finger. He's driving me insane. Safety Does concerns. he have boogers? They didn't allow for boogers? more training and take the time to do that. They did not respond to the negligent discharge and itchy, deal with Paul. that. Mr. Halls talked to one of the guys briefly and that was all that happened. So you gotta set the they're not allowing a time for inventory for the armor. They're not allowing time for them to clean their weapons or deal with their weapons. This is management. You just heard Mr. Pesh state that the first assistant director is the primary person for safety on that set. Dave Halls have been doing this 30 years. Somebody doing it 30 years has a responsibility and duty to step in when there's safety things going on, and he's on several of those videos. He has a responsibility to step in and say, hey, we're going to stop this. We're going to slow this down. We're going to have meetings. We're going to have additional safety training, and we're going to address this. Ms. Gutierrez, Reed, come over here. We're going to do this, and we're going to talk to people. She also can come in and talk about that. And on those videos, they're both on the videos. But OSHA found, because of the lack of support, because she's a part-time armor, because she's not full-time, because she's not, there's not two of her, as Mr. Carpenter said, two is one and one is none. Well, here we didn't even have one. We had a half. So she's trying to run around and do various things. She's a half a, a, a job on a set with over 20 guns, and they want to lay the complete blame on her in this case, as opposed to OSHA, who investigated as an official agency and made an official determination that this was production and management that was responsible. That's important. That's an important finding because they said all of this was caused safety-wise by management. As Mr. Sousa told you, the buck stops with production. The buck stops with production. As in any organization, it starts at the top. You don't go and take one of the lowest people on the call sheet after something bad happens, after the whole management team is just thrown safety aside in favor of money, in favor of speed, in favor of profit, you throw all of that aside because at the end, you've got a convenient fall person, you've got a convenient scapegoat. And she may not be the armor on some days, she's a props person, but she's certainly the armor when everything goes bad. You know why? Because despite OSHA's uh, findings that they were responsible, production, the guys that you saw come in, the producers, the big guys, they want to sail off into the sunset and go on about their business, finish the movie, make the money, because they've got the convenient fall person sitting right here. And all that has to happen is everybody has to gang up Everybody has to have their talks after this happened and blame Hannah. So it has to happen. That's what happened in this case. You had a production company on a shoestring budget, an A-list actor that was really running the show. He was directing people in those clips, telling the camera person where to go, telling the armor where to go. And then you had a situation where at the end they had somebody they could all blame. It didn't work out with OSHA because OSHA didn't buy it. OSHA said it was the higher ups. So here we are in a criminal court where the government tries to pin all of it on Ms. Gutierrez Reed. And it's just not the truth. It's absolutely right. We do want the truth. We want the truth and all the facts that were found by OSHA to be considered. 
We wanted all of the facts that you don't have in this courtroom to be considered because that's the only fair way to do it, to resolve all reasonable doubt and to rule it out. If you don't have all the evidence, you can't rule out all of that reasonable doubt. I want to talk about foreseeability, and I want to play this for you. You probably remember that. Um, that was the scene where Mr. Baldwin runs up the hill and <coughs> cut is yelled. And right after cut is yelled, he shoots. That's, I submit, reasonable doubt, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Mr. Baldwin went off script. He chose to fire after cut was called. And you're going to see where he does later do the same thing in this tragic shooting. Mamie Mitchell told you on the stand, the script supervisor, that it was not in the script for Mr. Baldwin to point the weapon. It was not in the script for him to point the weapon. And we have to be very careful with facts when we're considering a, cr a criminal case and the beyond the reasonable doubt standard is extremely important because Ms. Gutierrez Reed, nor anybody else, knew that Mr. Baldwin in that moment was going to point the weapon right at Helena and Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza and do what he did. That is the concept of foreseeability. Now, Ms. Morrissey gave you an example of if I hand somebody a, a firearm and it's loaded and then they go and do something with it uh, and it hurts somebody. But here, what we had, we she did not know Mr. Baldwin was going to do what he did. No one, first of all, called her back into the church that he was using the gun at that time. She had given it to Halls to sit in in the church. Mr. Halls then gave it to Mr. Baldwin, and that is the conclusion of the lead investigator. That was what Baldwin said, and that is what Ms. Gutierrez Reed said. So Halls hands it to him. No one calls her back in to let her know Baldwin is doing that blocking scene. She doesn't know that's happening. The medic said she did not hear anybody call that out, first team, over the channel. So that's not getting put out. So Baldwin's doing an, another audible like he did on this video that you just saw. He's going off script. That defeats any idea that that was foreseeable to Miss Gutierrez Reed. If she doesn't know what's happening, she can't foresee it. That's a big part of the, inst the instruction. The other part I want to talk about foreseeability and where this matters is live rounds. Now live rounds in this type of situation has not happened in Hollywood. In the hundred years of Hollywood, this has not happened in a situation like we saw in this case. No one on that set foresaw, knew, or thought that live rounds were going to be on that set. No one. You did not hear one witness in this case, uh, even Miss Morrissey said, there was no evidence that Hannah knew about live rounds coming on or this, this was done. There's no evidence of that. Nobody thought live rounds were going to be on set. Mr. Souza um, told the doctors he couldn't believe it. He argued with them because it was inconceivable that live rounds would appear. Because of that, you, when you read the jury instructions, there's a concept in the involuntary manslaughter of an element of willful disregard of the rights of another. That word willful, and I'm going to go over it soon, means purposeful. That you willfully do, do something, you purposefully do something. What's impossible for the government to prove in this case... Can we approach? Oh, shit. Oh.
Yeah, guess what? It happened once. That's enough. It happened. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna... Facts. That, that, Ladies and gentlemen, that I'm going to talk about willful more in a moment when we get there. But it cannot be willful if Hannah does not know there's live rounds. And nobody did. So she did not do something willfully knowing that Baldwin could foreseeably hurt somebody with this firearm because she didn't know it was live. And let me give you an example. Um, it's akin to uh, a nurse, let's say in a hospital, who the pharmacy mislabels uh, a drug. And let's say it comes to her and, and somebody's ordered it be administered to a patient. She then administers it not knowing that it's a fatal drug of some other type. The pharmacy's mislabeled it. The patient passes. It's the same situation as we have here where the government would be saying the nurse committed involuntary manslaughter. No, that's not true because she did not know what happened. It's like a long time ago um, when the Tylenol capsules were laced with, with cyanide way back in the 80s or somewhere around there. Wow. What? The, there was no prosecution of the pharmacies that didn't know about this, that were tainted by it. It's the same type of situation we have here with the nurse. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed did not know there were live rounds and she was entitled to rely on production buying dummies and the boxes labeled dummies. She's entitled to rely on that. And that reliance is reasonable. So she cannot foresee a live round. Buzzy, 100%. Now, yes. I want to talk next about Ms. Gutierrez Reed's statements to law enforcement. You saw her first statement. She didn't have a, an attorney. She did waive her rights and answer her question. She had not been advised at that time. Ms. Hutchins had passed. And she came in a second time and answered all questions. The reason why I say that is she was cooperative. She was trying to assist in what this investigation, uh, what they were investigating. Now, Corporal Hancock, Corporal Hancock never fully investigated the source of the live rounds. And she told you that she focused on people on the set. So again, in ruling out reasonable doubt and where those live rounds came from, we have not done that in this case because there was never a full investigation as to the source of the live rounds. Let me give you an example. The state never called Joe Swanson. And it's kind of remarkable because Joe Swanson was the original source of where these came from. He's also the JS in all the boxes. So the idea that the person where it originated, you wouldn't call that person? and get some more information is, is interesting. But more than that, it leaves a huge hole in the origin of the live rounds. Let me tell you what else it did. Seth Kinney's fingerprints and DNA were never taken. Seth Kinney talked to Corporal Hancock 40 times or more. They supplied information back and forth. And he starts making you wonder about what's going on and why I'm, I'm called dishonest for raising the possibility that maybe Mr. Kinney was the source because he's pretty tight with law enforcement in this case, obviously. They don't do a prop search warrant until six days after the incident, and that was Corporal Hancock and the rest of the sheriffs. They don't search Mr. Kinney's business until over a month after. They never asked the FBI to check live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. And so we will not know if Mr. Kenny's fingerprints or anybody else's would have ever appeared on those live rounds on set because they didn't get that evidence. Bryce Ziegler, I want to tell you a little bit, remind you a little bit about his testimony and that's Mr. Ziegler. Um, he talked about Baldwin's revolver being single, single action. You have to cock it and then uh, every time you want to shoot it. He testified about breaking that firearm. They actually destroyed the firearm um, after testing that was approved by the sheriff. 
by hitting that with a hammer. He talked about that you can't determine a live round from a picture. And that's the other point I think is important to consider when considering the picture analysis. Now, the Latin print examiner the uh, examined various things, but she did not examine anything of uh, Seth Kenny wise. There's no analysis on the cartridges from the prop cart and found eight FBI employee prints. Mr. Gillette on the the powder testing only tested 11 rounds from Seth Kenny. Again, we know that he brought back 125 <coughs> from the group that went to 1883. And I also want to remind you about 1883, some of those were Starline brass rounds. And some of those, he said, had silver primers. So when we get to the set, the live rounds are Starline brass, and they have silver primers. It's a continuous chain that could have been traced from Del Reed all the way to Seth Kenny all the way back to the set. But they did not do that thorough investigation, and that's reasonable doubt they have not ruled out. The dummies, again, I submit this is another area of reasonable doubt. <coughs> Witnesses testified this set contained a dangerous mix of dummies. They were dangerous because it was impossible for the armor and prop master to hear and rattle all of the dummies, uh, especially under pressure, rushing, and noise on the set. You saw there was a lot of wind that day on the lapel. There's people running around. There's, I think at one point somebody said 200 people. There's all kinds of things going on. Um, and despite that, Mr. Haig uh, indicated in a quiet office he could not hear one of the dummies when it's rattled. That's dangerous because when you're trying to do it quickly, when there's a lot of noise, it may be a dummy. Um, it may not. You can't hear it rattle. Seth Kenny, again, mentioned in this case that he always rattle tested his rounds. And he made sure they're dummies. He told you all that. Well, the problem, the, even the box that they say was Seth Kenny's and the rounds that came out of it, there was one round, if you remember, that was gunked, and it didn't shake. That round had to be sent to the FBI to be broken apart and to be checked to see if it was live. So if he truly is that thorough and shaking, he missed that round. Now, the producers, they had oversight over the budget team. They didn't know where the funds were set aside for the armor. They were on location for filming, and they were fined the statutory maximum by OSHA for managerial safety violations. Again, OSHA found that the management team are the ones responsible, and yet we're here with Ms. Gutierrez-Reed the person on trial for the felony offenses. Sherilyn Schaefer was the medic on set. You recall she did not have a chest seals. Um, she, I think, was doing the best she could with the equipment that she had, but she didn't have the um, complete equipment to deal with you the... you got to be fucking kidding me, having a slide for the medic? The ...gunshot wound. She also indicated she never heard anyone call out use of a gun before the fatal shooting. Mamie Mitchell, I touched on this earlier, most important thing Miss Mitchell said was that it was not in the script for Baldwin to point the firearm. That goes directly to the element when you read the jury instructions and you all go back in to deliberate. Uh, that goes to foreseeability and whether or not anybody can foresee the moments Mr. Baldwin pointing the gun, using it as a, a pointer. He's up on the hill shooting after cut, and then he's shooting, uh, pointing the gun when he's not supposed to in scenes. David Halls, um, David Halls was the first assistant director, uh, as you remember, and he was in charge of overall safety. Now, he got a misdemeanor, uh, six months unsupervised probation, even though he was in charge of overall set safety. He never raised any concerns, and in fact, I think he said Hannah did a great job as armor. He indicated he did not hand the gun to Baldwin, but the sheriff contradicted this, so did Hannah, and so did Mr. Baldwin. Uh, and that was essentially Mr. Hall's testimony. 
Sarah Zachary, I remind you, she threw away rounds on set after the shooting, took items off the prop card. And she worked for All right, I got to pause this here. Are you fucking kidding me? They have the emoji, the the this emoji in their presentation? Are you kidding me? This is a professional presentation and they have this fucking blushing emoji? You've got to be fucking kidding me. And, he, and she texted and called him right after the shooting. She, one of her Are texts, she me? indicated she had said she was talking to Alec Baldwin and trying to keep her facts straight. She mentioned that she had loaded firearms on set. She picked up ammunition from Kenny at PDQ. I'll remind you in the testimony that Sarah Zachary and Hannah Gutierrez Reed went to Kenny's place before production started and he had given them ammunition, leathers, and firearms. So again, we don't know exactly what Mr. Kenny may have supplied to this set because it's not inventoried, it's not all invoiced. I also remind you about Sarah Zachary when you're considering her credibility and her testimony. She had the text where she wanted Hannah to go to jail and she's given complete immunity. Well, Seth Kenny. Again, I, I mentioned this, he supplied the leathers, guns, and ammo before arrest began. He had no inventory system. And I, we attached some pictures to the right that you can look at in the, the jury room about his place. It was an absolute mess. There was stored lime, live ammo in the bathroom. And one of the things I think was important to remind you of is he actually called Joe Swanson and had a conversation with him. And after he gets off the call. His first words are shit, shit, shit. And so that's something as an investigator you would think after he does that, maybe I should call Joe Swanson and see what's happening. See what that means. That reasonable doubt has not been ruled out. I went over this um, on the 1883 set and he brought 125 uh, rounds back. Mr. Carpenter, I want to remind you, he was the state's expert armor. One of the most important points he said was two is one and one is none. And here we didn't have uh, a properly staffed armor uh, component to the set. Luke Haig, he said the live rounds on set were reloads. Um, he could not hear the dummy rattle in a quiet office, and he said Mr. Bowen violated basic safety rules. Karen Kuhn, you may remember, was the photographer. She said the armor was checking guns before when she was present. And she also made a comment about Mr. Baldwin that on the day she was taking questions, I believe she said on the 21st, he told her to get out of his personal space and said something in a, in a manner that kind of goes along with how he was on the set. Um, Mr. Souza was kind about it. He said he had a strong personality, but you can see it in the videos and you can see how Mr. Baldwin was acting. Rebecca Smith, I want to talk about the tampering. She said that, that she hadn't used cocaine in 31 years. She saw a baggie inside a baggie for approximately five seconds. She didn't know if it was cocaine or meth or something else. Now she admitted at the end she was guessing. And we also know that the substance in the baggie was never tested. And so there, the only evidence you have of narcotics in this case is a guess. Now, Ms. Morrissey in her closing indicated that, well, of course we don't have the evidence. The whole thing is throwing it away. Well, you have to prove first that it was evidence. So in a normal tampering case, when let's say a firearm is thrown away and we know a firearm was used and somebody throws a firearm away, we know that was a firearm. So we know that would be evidence in a case involving a shooting. Here, we have an unknown substance. Again, they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubt by that. It's not enough to say it's probably something under a criminal standard. It's probably cocaine in that bag because Ms. Smith says it is. If it even happened, we don't even know this happened. The government hasn't established that except through her testimony. We don't know if there was a bag. We don't know if this actually was passed, and that's their burden. It, let's say it did happen. 
that you, you believe it did happen. It's not enough to say what was probably in that bag. They have the burden to rule it out beyond a reasonable doubt that it couldn't have been anything else. And she's already calling it in her testimony potentially multiple substances, cocaine, methamphetamine, or possibly something else. So she's not even certain about what it is. Without a, a, a test, without something presumptive to tell you on a test, there's no way of telling what was in that bag. And it's not enough in a criminal case. OSHA we talked about in detail, and I just want to remind you the root cause they found, they attributed all the responsibility for safety issues to management. Mr. Elliott, uh, he was defense expert investigator, he had an extensive law enforcement experience, if you recall, in APD and military. One of his big points was Mr. Baldwin was not segregated at the beginning, even though he was the known shooter. Hannah was segregated right away. Again, they zeroed in on her uh, in the, the rush to have her identified. He indicated there was 20 or so key witnesses not identified and segregated. And the problem with that is they can get their stories together and they can uh, change their stories, they can have their memories altered. We know this happened in this case because after the incident, Mr. Baldwin is talking to Sarah Zachary. Uh, she's, he's texting and talking to her. Seth Kenny is talking to Sarah Zachary. Mr. Halls is talking to Baldwin after. And so we don't have all the information they're talking about, but we do know they're coordinating, they're talking. The only one not in that group uh, was, was Hannah. And again, this was the idea. We've got to circle the wagons and we've got to pick out the person that's going to take the fall for everything that's happened here. That's Hannah. That's who they got. Law enforcement failed to follow up on the origin of the live rounds and their delayed search warrants caused problems with missing evidence. P.J. Pesh testified just this morning. Um, he had said, like everybody else, he's never seen in 35 years an armor split duties with props. Just real quick, if you missed it, folks, he completely skipped over his firearms expert yesterday. It's not possible for one person to keep track of so many firearms. And he indicated it's important to give the armor adequate time and resources, which OSHA said as well. She was not given that to do her job. I want to talk to you about the law that the judge instructed you on, and, and that is the law. What the judge uh, told you about is what has, we, we have to follow in terms of evaluating this. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. The kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. A doubt based on reason and common sense. So what the government has to do is rule out every reasonable doubt you may have based on reason and common sense. Or in this country, we don't convict people. That's the standard. And again, I go back to where I started at the beginning. If they didn't rule out the reasonable doubt on Miss Zachary throwing away the rounds, that is always going to be there. Because their theory based on you can identify these pictures and we know exactly what was on the set and what remained on the set, and what we will never know that because some of them were thrown away. And we didn't get all of Seth Kinney's rounds. We're never going to know that. Other areas of reasonable doubt, I've gone over the top two, top three. The prop cart was tampered with. Uh, we know that right after the incident, another individual moved it. Now, Lieutenant Benavides said he had eyes on uh, the entire time. But if you saw that video, you can make up your mind what you believe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, his camera appeared to be pointed right into the vehicle. And the individual getting the cart was way off in the other direction. He said he had his head turned. But you all can decide uh, what you think about that. 
The prop cart, there was unquestionably items taken from it. We don't know exactly what those are. That is another area of reasonable doubt that the government has not ruled out. You've had witnesses say throughout the trial you can't tell live ammo from a picture. And the reason is that the FBI said it has to be disassembled and you have to open it up because there's powder in it. If there's not powder in it, then it's not live. OSHA stated the root cause of all safety failures was management. OMI ruled this to be an accident, not a homicide. You heard evidence about the esophageal intubation was ineffective to provide oxygen to Helena. This also was a situation in this case where multiple lawsuits have been filed, and you can evaluate their testimony, those people who have filed lawsuits, with care and caution because they've got an interest potentially in what's happening in this case by being involved in lawsuits. Involuntary manslaughter, uh, you're going to have that instruction when you go back. That is the um, charge that the, the, Her Honor has read to you. She's given you the law on this. I want to focus you on a couple key points. The government has the burden to show each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the elements are the numbered items. What that means is if you all have reasonable doubts on any of these elements, Hannah cannot be convicted. And I want to focus you in on element three, that Hannah acted with a willful disregard. Again, you go back to willful disregard, the nurse example, and the idea that if somebody doesn't know, I mean, that could be the same thing with a nurse on trial for involuntary manslaughter, but if she doesn't know the drug was mislabeled, you cannot hold her criminally accountable for something like that. It's the same thing in this case, because no one knew there were live rounds. So she did not act willfully in anything that happened that day. In loading the, the firearm, this was a nor another day everybody thought on set. Loading the firearms, running to different things, doing the duties, Nobody's calling her back in for the blocking scene. Mr. Baldwin was doing something on his own. Nobody in the wildest dreams thought there was a live round. And because of that, the next element is that Hannah Gutierrez Reed that caused the death. I submit to you that what caused uh, her to pass was Mr. Baldwin going off script and pointing the weapon. Now, he didn't know uh, there was a live round in there either. He didn't know. Again, he's in the same position that nobody knew there was ever going to be a live round on that set. But the only the only ultimate act is this pointing of that weapon. Ms. Gutierrez wasn't in the church. She didn't point that weapon. She didn't pull it. Nobody called her back in. And because of that, those two elements, I submit to you, have not been proven on involuntary manslaughter. And they have to be. The government has to resolve all your reasonable doubts about that, or they don't. You cannot. Uh, we cannot convict. Mental state and willful disregard, uh, and that is going to be in your in your instructions. For you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the, the defendant acted with willful disregard. And and so the, again, that's the terminology: is willful disregard. You're also going to be instructed, the court instructed you, Her Honor, on negligent use of a firearm. And that is a, a lesser included offense of the involuntary manslaughter. Uh, so when you go back and deliberate, you will have uh, this in front of you as well, whether Ms. Gutierrez Reed endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. And again, the language is acted with willful disregard. That's what has to be proven under that charge <clears throat> for her, for you to resolve all of your reasonable doubts. Tampering with evidence, I think this is a, a real stretch, and it's a, it is a real stretch, and, and you talk about guessing. This one, they have to prove the defendant hit a bag of cocaine. Well, 
the only witness they have to it said it was either cocaine or meth or something else. So just just by the testimony alone, the beginning of that, you can't. There's no way of knowing it was a bag of cocaine. It's just impossible. There has to be reasonable doubt on that by the government's own witness. Their only witness. No law enforcement testing. There's nobody else. That this this is absolutely unproven in this case. And you don't even have to get to element two because element one is not even close to having, having been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Proximate cause, it's a legal term, but it's something the government has to prove as well. And this is where you get into that the passing was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez's act. The act was a significant cause of the death and the language I want to focus you in on, in a natural and continuous chain of events uninterrupted by an outside event. What these mean, and legal, these are the legal terminology, what it means is that what Hannah Gutierrez did had to be a foreseeable result, but again, that caused her death. But again, without her knowing that there was a live round, that's impossible to meet that standard. She did not have that knowledge, and there's no witness that came in here in this courtroom in two weeks to say she had that knowledge. Without it, nothing she did. She has that willful disregard because she just doesn't know. Now, was there an outside event as well? There was an outside event. There's two outside events. Whoever put the live round on set and then Mr. Baldwin in the end going off script and doing what he did. Those are outside events, outside of Miss Gutierrez Reed's control, that she didn't know was going to happen. That breaks any idea, uh, and there's reasonable doubt that she had anything to do ultimately with Helena Hutchins' death. Miss Gutierrez Reed was not a significant cause as a result of her death because of the reasons I've mentioned to you. Another instruction Her, Her Honor gave you is that negligence of a third person, again, I'm going to highlight the language, if it breaks the foreseeable chain of events. Um, again, the foreseeable chain of events on that set is you have dummy rounds, you have blank rounds, and then you have um, an orderly progression with how those are being used. Here we had a completely unforeseeable live round, uh, six live rounds that were on set, nobody could foresee. And then we have Mr. Baldwin's action in the end. Those were both unforeseeable to Miss Gutierrez Reed. The judge instructed you on, you all are the sole judge of the facts. You all are deciding the facts, ladies and gentlemen. And your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. It goes back to the tampering charge. Um, it goes back to some of the other aspects the government has told you. In this country, we can't decide and convict people on guesses. And that's a lot of what they've asked you to do in several areas, to guess, to assume, to speculate. It's not sufficient to convict people in this country to guess. It's not. And that's what they brought you and they've asked you to do on the tampering and other aspects of their charges. And that's not sufficient. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannah is not guilty on all the counts because of the law that Her Honor has given you. When you apply that law and you apply the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, she could not anticipate what Baldwin would do. It was not in the script. It was not foreseeable. Management was responsible for safety failures and not Hannah. There's zero evidence of cocaine. There's no testing. And again, I go back to the idea that Hannah is a scapegoat for all the management failures. They do hope she gets convicted, so they're all exonerated. They can move forward. They can finish that movie like Mr. Sousa said they did and make their money. But as he also told you, the buck always stops with production, and it's their responsibility. In any organization, it goes from the top down. And that's where the responsibility lies in this case. That's what OSHA said 
And that's also the truth. And the truth is important because justice for Helena does not mean injustice for Hannah. It does not mean injustice for Hannah. It does not mean they get to steamroll her and they get to come in and spin their version of facts and they get to call it truth. Because that's not truth. Truth is bringing you, ladies and gentlemen, everything they can. Justice is bringing you everything they can. Justice is not mocking theories that could come true that might have been the case. Justice is not laughing in court during some of our exchanges. And you can evaluate that as to their credibility, whether that was professional, whether if she didn't take court seriously, did she take the investigation seriously? I submit she did not. And so they can't come in here with a straight face and mock us and criticize us and tell you they have given you enough to convict her behind a reasonable doubt because they haven't. Thank you. Uh oh. All right. I'm gonna, State's reply. I'm going to pause it real quick. I don't want to get too far behind, but Karen's going to explode. <laughs> I, I think all three of us are about to explode, and I think the entire chat's about to explode. Now, after that nice little sermon on the mount, can I, can I make some points, please? Go. Because that first, hello, that's all I needed to say. Jesus Christ, it was her fucking job to make sure there were no live rounds on set. First point, bye, out. Second, Sarah was not the armorer, bye bye. Second, third, Seth was not the armorer. And although his workspace and his living space was a shit show, as we all saw, guess what else was a flaming dumpster fire from Satan's ass crack? Hannah's fucking Tin Man cart. <laughs> Hannah's fucking Joe the Can Man cart was a shit show from hell. So you want to do an equivalency, Mr. Bowles? Let's talk about Seth Kinney's disgusting living conditions, and let's talk about your fucking client's disgusting workspace. Let's just do that. Next, yes, I am exploding. Uh, basically, <laughs> the fact that uh, the relevant matching on the two containers is not relevant uh, bullshit. It is relevant because it shows where the live rounds were kept. So, yeah. Uh, Kitty's place, I went through that note. Uh, bullshit analogy about the nurse. And apologies to any nurses on the chat because that was really rotten. You have a clear liquid in a container taken from a prescription vault that you need a code for. And frankly, if it was mislabeled, that wouldn't be the prescriber's fault. It would be the manufacturer in a seven-figure civil suit. So let's not go down that false equivalency because Hannah had the responsibility of live rounds versus dummies versus blanks. And if you don't know what it is, you don't fucking use it. It's that real. It's really simple. And that was a really shitty false equivalency. And frankly, uh, if it doesn't rattle, you don't use it and you toss it. And I'd also like to talk about the government and OSHA and tell you what my dad told me years ago in the scariest nine words in the English language. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> bye bye I'm done with my uh, Karen, I, I know you couldn't see chat, but I mean, it's going wild for you. Everyone's like, I feel validated. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Bob, go ahead. What, what, what are your thoughts about the closing there? Yeah, I mean, the dude had a job to do. <laughs> it's tough. Like the bottom line is, is Karen's first point. That's her, it's her fucking job, man. Like the, to me, the rest of it's all white noise. End of the day, if you can't rely on the armor to make sure that there's not a live round that's loaded into a weapon that's going to be used on a set, I mean, who can you rely on? I mean, that's entirely the purpose of her being on that set was for that explicit reason. And she failed miserably. And as a result, Helena died. 
and someone else was shot. To me, it's it's pretty simple. Um, you know, the jury's just going to have to weave their way through the bullshit. And, uh, you know, because that is the germane point. That that was her job, period. End of conversation. Go ahead, Lisa. What, what were your thoughts? You know, uh, just a couple of thoughts. They uh, said um, that Baldwin pulled the gun out, that it was unscripted. It was this and that. couple things. One is, had she been on the set, she could have stopped everything and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't know we were going to do this. I need to check this weapon again. I need to double check all the ammunition that's in it or the blanks or the dummies or whatever the case was. So that's number one. Number two, you always have to go back. They, they're loving to throw Baldwin under the bus, but let's go back to that video. Baldwin was not pulling that pistol out of his holster until Joel Sousa said, pull it out. So they're going back to Baldwin, you know, had he not done this, had he not done this, had... It was Sousa that asked him to pull the fucking gun out of his holster. The rest of it, you know, there's a lot of things that I agree with him on as far as management and as far as let's pick the loneliest person, lowliest person on the totem pole and let's convict her. It still doesn't take away what Bob and Karen have just said. She's the one that loaded those bullets in there. It doesn't matter to me whether they came from Seth Kenny, her father, or anywhere else. I don't care if she went to, you know, the, if somebody went to the damn store on the camera crew and threw a bunch of live bullets in there. It doesn't matter. What matters is how did that live bullet get into his weapon? Exactly. And it was her. End of file. That's it. That's it. And, and you know what? That's what the civil lawsuits are for. That's where the deep pockets right. are. When they want to go and get the money, that's when they sue the production company. That's when all that shit about the higher ups and, you know, shit rolling downhill, that comes into play. Here, for this case, somebody's dead because she didn't do her job. She loaded a live round. I don't give a shit whether it was in the script or not, but for her loading a live round into a gun, it doesn't matter if Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger or not, if there's dummies in yep. there and there's not a, a, a bullet that's in there, that's going to kill somebody. He, it, it makes no difference. The bottom line is that was her job and she failed at it right. and she failed at it so spectacularly that somebody died as a result of it. Yeah. Absolutely. The, but, the, but for defense, but for her inaction yep. and her, exactly. her, her, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so let's see the state bring it home, and I'm going to give my professional opinion. What the fuck is with an emoji? The, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Bob, would you ever put something like that in a PowerPoint if you were doing a closing? Like, ser like that to me is, like, unprofessional. You don't put that. Like, if you're going to do a PowerPoint, that's fine. But I think like, the only emoji I might use would be the monocle guy, you know, the stink guy, the guy with the, the guy that's doing this. Like, yeah. maybe I'd use that one. I could see a world in which I, I, I do love that emoji. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's just way, a general proposition, Jay. No, I would. And again, folks, if you missed it. it, they completely went through all the witnesses except Del Boca Vista gun expert yesterday. Completely did not have a slide for him. That's how bad he did. Their own witness didn't even mention him. That whole thing was a waste yesterday. No point. All right, let's see the state bring this home. If Hannah, Hannah didn't... Hannah didn't know there was a live round on set. I agree. If Hannah knew there was a live round on set, this would be murder. And she loaded it into a prop gun, and it was used to kill Helena Hutchins. She wouldn't be charged with involuntary manslaughter. She'd be charged with second-degree murder. She'd be charged with first-degree depraved mind murder. This is an involuntary manslaughter charge because. She didn't know there were live rounds on set, and the reason she didn't know was through her own negligence, her own recklessness, her own willful disregard for the safety of other people. That willful disregard, that lack of care for the safety of other people that you have seen throughout this trial it is shocking. 
for Mr. Bowles she should sit down right to now. come up to She's this home. podium She's and really say it wasn't work. foreseeable that Alec Baldwin was going to go off script and pull the hammer and pull the trigger. He showed you a video of Alec Baldwin going off script. Alec Baldwin went off script. Hannah Gutierrez knew it. She was she there. Knew. Hannah Gutierrez knew that Baldwin was loose. She knew it. She didn't do anything about it, even though it was her job. It was her job. It is her job to say to an A-list actor, if in fact that's what you want to call him, um, Ooh. hey, <laughs> you can't behave that way with those firearms. That is her job. That is what they pay her for. That is the job that she applied for. That is the job that she accepted. Foreseeability. You want to talk about off script? Just remember those videos of the stuntman. That's not within the script. She was there. She watched it. She knew these people would go off script. You know she didn't check the rounds. If she checked the rounds, they wouldn't have been floating around that movie set the entire time, undetected. Give you everything we've got. You have absolutely everything we have. This law enforcement team and this team of prosecutors have reviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of photos and thousands of videos. We have interviewed countless people, many of whom you didn't even hear from. We can't stay here forever. You have absolutely everything you need. One of the amazingly shocking things about this case to me has always been, and it's to Detective Hancock's credit, a defense attorney with his own agenda, no question, comes to her and says, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny. That's his job. Okay, let's make that clear. That's Mr. Bowles' job. He gets Hannah's dad to say, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny. Rather than ignore them, she gets a search warrant. She took his speculative agenda, presented it to a judge, got a search warrant, and searched that man's property. And oh my heavens, what did they find? They found exactly what Thel Reed said they would find. They found live ammunition with semi wad cutter projectiles. You have everything you have. You, you, you have everything we have. You have everything you will ever need to convict her. This is a hundred percent foreseeable. Hannah Gutierrez is not a scapegoat. Hannah Gutierrez is not being treated as a scapegoat. Mr. Halls was charged criminally. To his credit, he took an early plea and he got the benefit of that. Mr. Baldwin has now been indicted. Everyone with criminal culpability has been criminally charged in this case. She's not being scapegoated. She is being treated like everyone else. She is not being given a break because she's a woman. She is not being given a break because she's young. Because that's not how the law works. Let me just review my notes real quick. And as I promised you, I am going to try to speed this up for you. Please keep in mind... Mr. Bowles comes up to the podium and says, Sarah Zachary threw rounds away. She did. Obviously she did. She admitted it. She told law enforcement that she did it. And rather than try to prosecute her for tampering with evidence, for panicking and throwing some rounds away, 
She agreed to come in and testify, and her agreement is that she must testify truthfully. And she testified truthfully. You want to know why we don't have an inertia puller in evidence? Why we don't have a box of dummies that Ms. Gutierrez said she brought on set? She said she brought two boxes. We've only got one. You want to know why? Because she went to the prop truck on October 23rd, got access to it, took a bunch of gun belts, and a couple of boxes. Your Honor, I want to object. Uh-oh. Well, that's unusual on closing arguments, just saying. Man, she needs to take a deep she breath. She took stuff oh. out of the prop truck. She took gun belts. You heard from Sarah Zachary that those were gun belts that she brought from another movie set that were already loaded with dummy rounds. Who knows what was in them? So, I, I mean, she's literally like taking deep breaths, composing herself. I've never seen anything. I want to make sure that we understand what reasonable doubt means. Reasonable doubt means the doubt must be reasonable. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Brian Norvell. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Seth Kinney. All investigative leads were exhausted. He simply didn't do anything wrong. You want to talk about scapegoating? That's the guy that got scapegoated. The doubt must be reasonable. And I don't have to prove this case beyond all possible doubt. If that is what the law required, my heavens, we live in a world of infinite possibilities. The government would never be able to prove a case beyond all possible doubt. We'd have to have a video of absolutely everything that took place. It's not the standard, and it doesn't have to be the standard. So when you're back there and you're talking about doubt, make sure it's a reasonable one under this set of circumstances. You know, Mr. Bowles says to you, these production outfitters were just from one day. That's right. All that happened in one day. Imagine what all the other days were like. That was one day. Mr. Bowles is right. The crew didn't believe there were live rounds on set. They believed that she was going to do her job. Ooh. They believed that she did her job. The old this job. isn't Seth Kinney's responsibility to inventory rounds, although he did it. That wasn't his responsibility. Rust Productions didn't provide all of the dummy rounds to the set of this movie. You know from her own statements she brought two boxes on herself. We're not living in an alternate reality. All right. Let's go through these. I'll go through them relatively quickly. When you all go back into the jury deliberation room, you will have your own copy. Uh, so you certainly will have a copy to reference. Um, these are some of the instructions that are important to us. Your verdict should not be uh, based on sympathy or prejudice. Sympathy or prejudice. Huh? It's not showing on the screen. Oh. Oh, I see. There we go. Thank the you, Elmo. Mr. Lewis. They have not done well with the Elmo about this trip. Elmos are tough. So man. it can't be Our based on sympathy tough. or prejudice. And for any of you who are feeling sympathetic, 
because she is young and she is maybe inexperienced. Although by her own statement to Detective Hancock, she would tell you she wasn't. You all are on this jury because during voir dire, you agreed to follow the law. And I will ask you to do it right now. If you had said during voir dire, I can't follow the law, I feel too sympathetic, you wouldn't be here. And if you can't follow the law, you can probably excuse yourselves. Jeez. Man, if I'm on the jury, I don't know if I like it. It's like reprimanding the jury. I'm going to skip that one. That's an easy one. You must not concern yourselves with the consequences of your verdict. That is the law. That is the law that you agreed to follow. That is the law that you are required to follow. Anna Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by, hand, by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. There can be absolutely no doubt. That happened. Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by her actions. Yeah, she knew. This was completely foreseeable. She was trained in firearms. She knows what we all know. Guns can kill you. You gotta be really careful. Her act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Twelve A is the alternative theory, and so let me explain to you that twelve and twelve A are alternatives. You must find, you must make a decision about guilt or innocence unanimously to the count, not to the alternatives. So six of you can say. I think she's guilty of 12, but not 12A. Another six of you can say, we think she's guilty of 12A, but not 12. Done. You're done. Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm. Yes, she certainly did. She told the police she did. She failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition. Of course, you know that. She didn't do it just once. She did it numerous times. She acted with willful disregard for the safety of others, without question. So you are being presented with what's called a lesser included offense. And I will remind you the instructions that the judge read you at the beginning. Um, your first job is to see if you can agree on involuntary manslaughter. If you find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter on either alternative, you do not move on to this misdemeanor. It's done. If you find her not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you get to move on to the misdemeanor. You've heard a lot about that, I'll skip it. This is what we call a general criminal intent instruction and I want to just make sure that you understand this instruction only applies to the tampering with evidence. It does not apply to the involuntary manslaughter because she is charged with negligent homicide, not intentional. Very importantly, 
are the proximate cause jury instructions. These jury instructions are what allows you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty, even though Mr. Baldwin may have also been a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. So let's go through it. The death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm. Of course it was. The act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside event, resulted in the death and without which the death would not have occurred. She brought a bunch of live rounds on set, accidentally, but negligently. She loaded one of them into a prop gun, and this was after they were loaded into Jensen Ackles' gun belt and Alec Baldwin's holster. And she told Dave Halls, this is a cold gun. He told the crew, it's a cold gun. At that point, everyone certainly assumed that there wasn't a live round. She knew Baldwin would go off script. She didn't have prop duties to tend to. She walked out. And even if she had been there, it wouldn't have made a difference because you have seen the incredible lack of control that she exercised as the only person on the movie set in charge of firearms. There is no intervening event. If you think the intervening event is that Baldwin manipulated the gun, that was, that's the whole purpose of the prop. He's going to manipulate it. You saw a bunch of other actors do it. Very importantly, there may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly tr contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. If you think Baldwin's act was a significant cause of death, that's okay. You can still convict her. Jury instruction 20. If you find the, neglig the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, the defendant is not guilty. Well, that's not this case. She brought the live rounds on set. She put a live round in a prop gun. That's the reason that Ms. Hutchins is dead. One of at least two reasons. I will again thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I know that this has been hard work for you folks. Um, I will ask you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter <clears throat> and tampering with evidence. And I will ask you to bring some justice to Helena Hutchins. Thank you. All right, thank you. Instruction number 22, I will now ask you to retire to the jury room to begin your deliberations. You will be provided a copy of the jury instructions and the exhibits introduced as evidence will be made available to you. Prior to beginning your deliberations, you will need to select one of you to act as four person. That person will preside over your deliberations and will speak for the jury here in court. Forms of verdict have been prepared for your use. 
You will take these forms to the jury room when you have reached a unanimous agreement as to your verdict. The foreperson will sign the forms which express your verdict. You will then return all forms of verdict, these instructions, and any exhibits to the courtroom. There are 12 that deliberate. There are four alternates on this jury given the long uh, length of this jury. Uh, keeping with the privacy, I'm going to pass this instruction um, down with uh, the help of Ryan. You're going to look at this is one of your names, and you are one of the alternates. See you later, what I'm going to ask um, the bailiffs to do is to first take the alternates out so they can get their belongings, and I'm going to ask you to meet me down at the end of the hallway to ex explain. All right, we don't a, need to hear this shit. Tell alternates. <laughs> so to make sure nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, nothing's going to happen there. So she did a great job there. You know, she really did. Yeah. Uh, let me. Put yeah, this. you know, I, I, my takeaway from from the defense really, and this was like sandpaper on my butt, was you know, Ooh. gosh, gee. I guess Hannah's job just came with no responsibility at all. It's Seth's fault. It's, you know, this guy's fault. It's, that's, it's Sarah's fault. It's the paramedic's fault. It's the helicopter's fault. It's the freaking church's fault. You know, it's the dirt's fault. It's everybody's fault but your client. Your client was the armorer and had that responsibility. And I think that for the jury, reading the comments of the chat, and the people that, you know, they've watched this, they understand it, they know what's going on. These are jurors. Reading what they've said and their astute things that they're picking up on, I don't think the jury in that courtroom is going to be much different. It all boils down to she was responsible for the gun, she was responsible for the ammo, she loaded the round, regardless of what Alec Baldwin's culpability is in this, that's for later. That, to me... Involuntary manslaughter, I, I, I think it's a done deal. And I wouldn't be surprised if this jury, I would say they'll probably be back before lunch tomorrow. That's my, if I was going to put a bet, that's what I would say. They're not going to come back today. I don't think they're going to make it that quick. What do you think, Bob? Uh, I think, I think they're going to come to a decision pretty quickly, to be honest with you. I, I, to me, it's just so clear, man. You, you know, I mean, like everything else is bullshit. The only thing that matters is that she had one job that she was tasked with, and that is to make sure that a live round does not make it into a weapon that is going to be used during the filming of the movie. And she, she failed miserably. And again, it resulted in Helena's death. And that is reckless. And I think that they've established the, the foreseeability uh, and then some. You know, and I think that the causation is has been established as well. I, I think, and she did a great job explaining the two things about number one, uh, you know, the involuntary, and then the lesser included. You know, because juries can get confused about that, and that was the question that I had answered in the chat: whether or not you know you can't get can, can't get convicted of both of them. It's got to be one or the other. And then uh, additionally, kind of harping and focusing on uh, the fact of foreseeability and causation. Like those two were, those are the two things that I always worry about if a jury is going to be able to kind of wrap their mind around. Because the bottom line is, it, look, she loaded the thing. She, she, she is solely responsible for bringing them on set, for loading them into the weapon. No one else can be blamed for that. And it was her job, period. Like to me, it's, it, this is a very simple case. Like the only thing that I think that the jury may, you know, battle with a little bit is, you know, that Baldwin pulled the trigger, but she addressed that, you know, she did. She says, look, we're coming after him too. You know, I mean, like, but at the end of the day, it's like Karen was saying, it is the, but for argument, but for her loading a live round in that weapon, Helena is not dead and we're not here right now. What do you think, Lisa? I agree a hundred percent. You know, all of it, all of the shit that they threw at the wall. And it still comes down to the fact that she loaded that bullet into the gun. I, it, it just, none of the rest of it matters. It just really comes down to that. I've seen a couple of people commenting in the, um, in the comment section about COVID and maybe that's why Gutierrez couldn't be in there. You know, the COVID <clears throat> protocols that were in place on film sets 
would not have excluded Hannah Gutierrez from being on that set. There was the zone A, zone B, zone, B, zone C to Z. And she, zone A was you deal with the actors, you're tested more accurately, and you are on set at all times. It's really that simple. And she would have had zone A no matter what because of who she was. So it, it, you can't even give her that excuse. And it still goes back to, even if they had said, you can't be on this set, it still goes back to the fact that she loaded that bullet. Yes, Dave Halls is equally responsible. And the fact that they gave him a deal for the testimony that he gave, I, I would rather see him in prison than the useless, useless testimony that he gave for the prosecution. 100% useless. It, I think at some point Karen called him uh, uh, Elmer Fudd because every time he was going to lie, he'd start stuttering and take a drink. And, you know, uh, yes, there are a lot of other guilty people that didn't go along with it. But right now we're in Gutierrez's trial and she's 100 percent guilty. And the prosecutor in, in her final summation just brought it all out. I mean, just put all the pieces together of some of the things that I missed, some of the things that I didn't understand were important. And she just pulled it all together in an hour and, and made it me just go, fuck yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm convicting her. Yeah, I, I thought she had passion. I thought Bowles was kind of monotone. And, and that, that rebuttal, you know, rebuttal, she was like fired up. I, I Like I said, I have never seen like, that. Exasperated. She, had, she, she was exasperated. Take, yeah, she had to take a deep breath. I have not seen that since I've been covering. Granted, it's not been that long a time, but I, I've never seen that much like having to take a breath and like, I don't know. Go ahead, Karen. I, th I feel like you're going to say something. I think you wonder after sitting next to Gutierrez for what has it been, nine days, 10 days, and watching her attitude, if it just doesn't just start, you know, it's boiling all of our blood sitting out here. Imagine sitting three feet from her and all the times that the camera isn't on her and watching her be fidgety and watching her, you know, hearing her, and, you know, the whisper. Uh, all that oh, my God. I too. <laughs> Uh, All okay. right. Hey, listen, y'all, I got to bounce. Uh, we're trying to, we're having Hallie's birthday dinner tonight. I love all of you. Oh, Bob, been, thank you so much, Bob, for coming on. I love hanging with you guys. Thank you guys in the chat. You're amazing. Uh, and Check I'm, out Bob's I'm, YouTube podcast. And what's coming up? Anything coming up, Bob Garcia? Episodes? Well, I was, I was going to cover uh, the trial, but I'm, I'm going out to Othram for like a super secret, apparently super secret, like, uh, like I'm getting to check out the lab, like a little tour. So I'm, <laughs> I'm excited about that tomorrow, but I, I, I wanted to cover, uh, the, you know, the shooting, the Oxford case, like crumbly, his trial, they just impaneled a jury. Dizzy was telling me I was planning on covering that, but I'm out of town. So I'm going to see and Jay, I might put you on duty. If I can get Allie to at least cover the openings tomorrow morning. If you're not doing shit, so uh, yeah, I'll, but I'll, I'll hit you I'll, up I can later. Help her for sure, absolutely. Yeah, if you need me help, let me know. All right, all right, chat. Love you guys, right. uh, Karen hey, and Lisa. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for hanging hey, with Bob. us. Thank you so much, Bob. Bye. Guys, please check out the podcast, the YouTube, uh, and thank you, Bob. Let me switch this. To all right, you. love you, brother. Love you. Say happy birthday, right. Ali. Right, I will. Me, all right, bye. Bye. Let me switch this to three people. Please have it set up. Oh no, I gotta now. I gotta change the camera. One sec. <laughs> Uh, shit. Hold on, guys. Sorry, I will fix this one second. Let me switch this. To, there we go. Guys, if you knew what I was doing behind the scenes. All right, guys. I can't thank you guys seriously enough. You've been watching with us this whole time. You've been in the chat helping us. I, I'm just curious. Just, um, I mean, overall impressions of the trial. Did it go how you expected? Was there any surprises? Uh, go ahead, Karen. I, I think the, <laughs> I'll be really honest, the biggest surprise came yesterday with uh, the, the witness they skipped, Mr. So-and-so. The fourth, the third, or whatever. You know, was. Harlan. And, and Dipstick the third, or whatever his name was. Good <laughs> Lord. I mean, take Peepaw back to the bingo parlor. For <laughs> um, you know, that, that was crazy. I have never, in my 20 25 years i have never seen anything like that before in my life um you know i i think for the defense you, you can't you have a really hard time defending the indefensible 
And I think that that was the challenge that the defense had here. I mean, they had to work around. They were throwing spaghetti at the wall. They had all these different deflections. And like I said in our last chat, it was throwing chaff, right? Throwing flack in the air to see what hits, right? And that Sometimes when you have a defense of the indefensible, that's where you have to go. And I think that that was the end around. And that was sort of my takeaway from the closing arguments from this defense attorney, Mr. Bowles. You know, I think he he had to sort of wrap it in this really large balloon package and leave Hannah in this tiny little dot in the center and sort of create this insulation around her. And it didn't work. It, it didn't land at all. It was very flat. The prosecution, like I said, with the timeline, bam, bam, this happened this day, this happened this day, this, 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 and this. It was very streamlined and, and, and really well thought out considering the week's worth of not being able to follow anything, because like Bob said, they're trying to get evidence in in different ways. Um, you know, to me, it's kind of a no brainer, but juries are funny. So we'll have to see, you know, this is in their hands now. It's completely out of, out of everybody's hands. It always has been. It'll be interesting to see what they find. And I thought it was interesting before I go to Lisa, I thought it was interesting. Someone brought a, a good point. He kept saying the government and I just, I don't know the venue. I don't know, like, I don't know, like the, the, the people there, but like, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't like the government and think there's conspiracy theories and think that there that certain people are being pointed out when they shouldn't be pointed out. So, like, you never know with the jury, like you said. Uh, but go ahead, Lisa. What, what were your what were your thoughts? I think it, it, it probably went almost exactly as I thought it would. I was um, disappointed in the defense not hammering home stuff. There were so many questions as a as a juror that I would have wanted to know or things that really could have helped him drive home points. Like, you know, when he had the, uh, the, the two producers, the two, you know, I called them the twins when he had them up there, you know, taking a budget, why didn't he get a copy of the budget? Can you tell me how much you made? Can you tell me how much you made? Can you tell me how much you had in the budget for Hannah Gutierrez, you know, nailing some of that stuff home, I think would have helped his case a lot. And he didn't. He had like, you know, Karen said, peephole up there. There were so many things that I had hoped that he would drive home that may have or may not have swayed the jury. It would not have swayed me. But there were so many things where I think he just failed, failed, failed. And it was it was like watching an episode or the whole series jury duty. I mean, there were so many times where You'd hear Karen going, are we getting pumped? What is happening here? Because it was just ridiculous. Um, and I keep asking, you know, is she going to, if she's convicted, is she going to get a reversal of the conviction due to inadequate representation? No, oh, no, no. And here's the reason why, because they did bring in experts, you know, like, like Bob said, when you have a weak case, getting good experts is real hard. And you know, they couldn't because she did it and they're looking at the case going, well, how the hell am I going to, yeah, you're going to pay me. And I'm not a liar for hire. Like some people are, and I'm not saying people in this case were necessary liars for hire. I think some of them were hacks. Um, but it's hard to get a good competent expert witness when your case is so weak. So I think they did bring the people on rather, whether or not they were <laughs> effective Lawyer can't really control that because he doesn't know what they're going to say on the stand or how they're going to behave, even if he preps them. So that's sort of a chance that you take. But I don't think it's going to be an effectiveness of counsel. You know, if anything else, it'll be an appeal based on new evidence, whatever that might be. And I know, know. I know Bob has talked about that. That's like a really hard uh, thing to prove. Like, so the standard is extremely difficult to, because that's what everyone does essentially when they, you know, if they lose, they try to make that yeah. case. So from what Bob has said before, it's very hard. And I, you know, I just think about this lawyer and the fact that he let her, the, he started this off terribly. Why would he even let her go to that police interview? If, if Bob, there's no way in a million years, Bob would have let his client, I mean, they were learning things in, I mean, was he trying to like get stuff from like the, the detective that he didn't know, but like you don't let your client go in there. And again, she, there's points that she's just, that they used in that, in her closing argument, nonetheless about being flippant and just being like, what about my, like about my job? Like what a mistake to, in my opinion, that he ever even let her go to that police interview. Like, why would you do that? I, I don't I agree. With and that. also based on, 
the the part I only saw the first forty five minutes, but based on the Jensen Eccles police interview, Bowles should have called him too, because what he said was, "Hey, listen, you know, I I'm all of, first of all, he made a fool of her." And that exemplifies everything that we say about actors bowling over people and, and knowing, like the, the prosecutor's expert, when to stop and how to shut it down. It, it proved that. It proved that, you know, uh, he was being a dick and that they all were and not taking it seriously themselves. But also, you know, there was a, the point where he also said for the prosecution, listen, I knew she was young and inexperienced, but everybody's got to start somewhere. So I was like, hey, yeah, let's let's uh, let, let's give her a chance here. But at some point they all went, oh, fuck, this is not a good thing. And maybe it wasn't a great idea. And nobody stopped the train wreck. I don't know. Uh, Charlotte brings up a good point, And I forgot to bring this up when Bob was here. I thought that was really interesting when, when Bo- I'll make this, he, she, she says, Bowles is a man who uses the final words of his closing statements to get a personal dig in. Terrible man, that should have been a final thought defending his client, not a dig. That I, I t- Not a dig at the prosecutor. That was bizarre to me when he was like, he was just like, oh, well, they're laughing. You could tell if they're taking this serious. Like, that's not part, of, that's your closing argument? Like, I, go ahead, Karen. What did I tell you about pounding the table, Jay? There it is in spades. They don't have a, a good argument for the client, so they're going to go after the witnesses. They're going to go after the prosecution. They're going to they're going to pound the table. There it is. I've seen it happen many, many times. Defense does not have a case. It is so rock solid. Why in the hell they allowed their client to go to court? Client-driven decisions, I assume. But, you know, after our testimony and we put this whole case to bed... What does the defense do? Come after my credibility. Come after my co-workers' credibility. Come after eyewitnesses' credibility. You know, the, the my cousin Vinny. How many fingers am I holding up? Are these leaves? You see these leaves? They're leaves, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the pounding the table. And that's all that was. It It was a little, I'd call it a little unprofessional. It wasn't really necessary, but that's sometimes that's that's the card that they play. Do we know for a fact that she was offered a plea deal? Yes. Does anybody, she, was, she absolutely was? She was, and it's sealed. Yeah. But, yep, she was absolutely offered a, we don't know what it was, but, uh, and I also, but, but bringing that up, thank you, Dizzy, who's been giving us all the information. She has yes. confirmed that she has all the documents. It it, it was definitely offered, uh, and it was sealed, so we don't know what it was. So that's, the, I mean, I you know. Who knows what they offer her? Whatever it was, she should have taken it. It probably cost her a hundred grand for this attorney uh and uh, and their experts you know minimum she should have taken the deal she'd be out by now she'd probably be out by now because if there was any time you know i don't know what it's like in new mexico but the they're letting people out left and right or putting them on probation five days after they walk in for a prison sentence because our prisons are so overcrowded well look at dave hall dave hall's got nothing nothing nothing. so like who knows what they were offering her um but uh, yeah. I, I gotta again thank you guys, and I got I know a lot of people. This is like maybe their first trial they watched. This was this was something, and I want to thank you all so much for like watching with us. Uh, thank all the mods who have been like keeping this all together, um, and thank you guys seriously. Like this has been like how lucky am I that I can have you guys like <laughs> you guys come on here, experts in this case to break it down for everyone. So that's why, like, I can't pay the, my guests, guys. So, like, that's why I'm, I wish I could, but we're sharing the link. So please, like, help them out. Check out the books and check out the podcasts. Um, but, yeah, that's, uh, I, this has been a wild, this has been a wild case. And I get a lot of people, let me see the poll here. I, I did a poll. I never know how, what time frame to put. I said, how long do you think the jury will be? So you're saying she would do one year minimum, no matter what her plea deal was? Well, we don't. I mean, I, I think it's sealed, so I don't think we know. Uh, I got, that's I what got I got. I got in the comments. Uh, all right, all. Karen, Karen, I'll let you guys go. Thank you right. so so much, guys. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you very much. We had a great time. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> all right, take care, everybody.